Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. Well, Dynamite and SmackDown gave us very little entertainment this week, but we've got tales from the territories to keep us happy coming up. And our guest today will be Evan Husty and Jason Eisner to talk about that program. Plus, we'll speak about the late Antonio Inoki and so much more. And to join me in this, Ho Lion Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. Is he a podcaster or an audio entertainer? The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Or maybe I should say Ichi Ni Sanda. A pleasure to be here once again. And we have a lot to talk about here this week. Well, you shouldn't be down in your garden on your knees if your knees are itchy. How'd you get garden? Itchy Ni Where'd you get garden? You got itchy knees. You're down in the garden, weeding the garden. You got itchy knees. It's because of the mosquitoes and the grubs buried in the dirt. The grubs? The grubs. That's what the moles eat. The moles eat the grubs in the dirt. I don't know too much about mole culture or what's happening with the grubs. Well, wait honest. a minute. Now, we've, we've done about all we can do with the anime sim, sim dating thing. Oh, don't be sure of that. So maybe we should go to mole culture. <laughs> <laughs> mole culture. All right. There's a whole underground subterranean culture centering around and revolving around the moles. When we do mole culture, when do we get to the AEW locker room? Well, there's more moles there than almost anywhere except my backyard, so we'd have to get in that. You know those moles, they're cute when you see them, but goddamn the damage. Anyway, speaking of damage, yesterday was a red letter day supposedly supposed to be in my life where finally about four months after we ordered them the brand new custom made high energy efficient replacement door or doors that we had ordered for this remodel project that continues were finally going to come in and they did come in and they got here bright and early we had the contractor and we had the window people and we had all the various personnel and brian what we've done is we've got the interior portion of the door uh, doors plural are stained the, with the dark stain it's going to that matches our interior trim and the outside of the doors are white because that matches the trim on the on the house right and that's exactly what we got doors white on the outside and stained on the inside. But the problem was, there were also two sets of interior doors that didn't have an outside, because they're inside the house. And they came out stained on one side and white on the other side also. And there ain't no white inside these rooms. So we had, we had a momentary perplexion where we couldn't figure out what the fuck we were going to do and after some muttering back and forth i finally came up with a brilliant idea that i pitched to the window and door people which they seemed to think would work and it just it's going to take a little while longer for me to get the proper doors and when uh, doors into the house so the the remodel project goes on like a no time limit Texas death match. It will never be over. It will never be over until your bank account is empty and you're a broken man laying out in the backyard on top of your old siding. It will never be over. Are you doing a promo on yourself? Yes, I am. <laughs> and all the time that and the, the, they still they still put in some doors obviously and there was some trim that had to be put in so there's banging and there's hammering and there's drilling and i'm on the other side of the wall of one of these rooms trying as best i can through this whole day to sign and box action figures and which i will have you know the the your show was the last one we did right this is mine your show, The drive Through, was the last one we did. I announced then that the first 150 figures ordered on September 17th had been placed in the hands of the Feather Bottoms, and I'm proud to announce that today, the first 300 figures, by the time that you hear the sound of my voice, ladies and gentlemen, the first 300 action figures ordered on September 17th 
will be signed and boxed and in the hands of the feather bottoms. And this is cooking. And that's what we did, by the way. We're going to do everything, everything that was ordered the first day that everything went on sale, September 17th. We're doing those first for the people who made the, the effort to get in there early. And as we mentioned, there were about 700 and something of those. Well, 300 down, 400 left to go. And then the ones ordered after September 17th will go a little quicker. And by the way, did I mention there's not only a only a one to two week turnaround on non-figure orders like t-shirts and autograph pictures and behind the curtain graphic novels, cult to cornet membership certificates, but there are still some. Monday Night Raw debut pink and red suit variants available. We're down in the 200 and somethings. And Santa Corny is more than half gone and ain't going to make it till Christmas. But if you jump in now, he may make it till Thanksgiving or till uh, Halloween. I'm not sure. JimCornette.com, everybody. The feather bottoms are on the case. And we're keeping everybody up to date. Thank you for your support. Well, what do you got? This is your show. Uh -huh. I'll remind you. I'm just supposed to sit here and help out. Well, that's, you know, funny you should mention that. Because you're supposed to help out, right, Brian? Every once in a while on these programs, I ask you to do a minor task, something simple, something easy, right? And as a matter of fact, on one of the programs recently, I asked you to do a an ordinary, everyday, mundane task, something that people do constantly all the time, doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of physical effort, and you absolutely refuse to do it. For some unknown reason, you refused to Google for me whether it was legal or not to fuck sheep oh, in this? Japan. I had no idea where you were going. This? Yes. You refused to Google whether it was legal to fuck sheep in Japan for me so that I could inform the listeners. You're right. I absolutely refused to do that. What, well, see, it just you're, you're, you're just, your dog, you're sandbagging is what you're doing these days, Brian. You're sandbagging me. You're supposed to be keeping up your part of the bargain here. You, so basically, one of the viewers, one of the listeners, Ron DeShane, as a matter of fact, had to do the, your work for you. And he emails gentlemen. Yeah. And in case the FBI is listening, what's his address? Well, that's uh, 129 Bonnie Meadow Court, Springfield, Illinois, 42651. Ron writes, gentlemen, Brian should have Googled the legality of sheep fucking in Japan. Because I certainly did. And found out that he was absolutely wrong in his confident assertions that fucking a sheep, an alpaca, a mule, or any other animal in Japan is illegal. Unlike Peru, which has laws specifically forbidding fornication with alpacas, Japan is one of the few countries in the world with absolutely no laws against bestiality. It's nice to learn things. That's the way he signs off. All right. So there you go, Brian. We would have known that. Now go find the sheep, Rhonda. Oh, yeah, okay. That's what it is. All right. Well, well thank, I just... Well, I thank just, you, Rhonda, for uh, using your browser to look for something that you seem very yeah. enthusiastic to find the answer to, Rhonda. So... Seemed like he was already read up on it, to be honest with you. Help me, Rhonda. Help me get her out of my corral. Help me, do they still, do, you do they still count sheep when they go to sleep? Is that like... Well, the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering what what do you keep sheep in? Is it it's not a corral? Would it be a a, a sheep shed? Oh, I guess a sheep shed, maybe sheep shed. Maybe that well, that, there's got to be some name for it. You if you put chickens in something, it's a coop. Rhonda Shane sheep shed. Rhonda Shane sheep shed. How many sheep could Rhonda shed if if Rhonda could shed sheep in Tokyo? Well, there's a great transition here, ladies and gentlemen. No, there isn't. No, there is yes. not. <laughs> Before we go any further, oh my God, you've made me hurt myself. Before we go any further, 
Uh, we must acknowledge the passing of a wrestling icon. It is not my fault that this transition worked out that way. Um, it's Antonio precisely, Inoki. It's precisely your fault. <laughs> 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 All right. Antonio Inoki. See, we're trying to keep the people from being too down about this. I don't know how many personal friends of Antonio Inoki's out there in the audience. I actually personally never met the man. I met Baba, didn't meet Inoki. Met Baba very in passing, and, and I was low on a totem pole at that point in time, so I didn't engage in any long conversation. But, um, but Inoki passed away 79 years old. The stories had been going out lately that he'd been in real bad health. I guess he'd been seen in public in a wheelchair. He was, you know, hospitalized or assisted living or something or other. But, um, Brian, I, I, we can't do, if we tried to do chapter and verse on the career of Antonio Inoki and just hit the high points, we'd still be here for five hours, and that'd be the only thing we'd talk about on the program. But as a as an introduction to any of the the younger folks out there who accidentally listen to us or anybody who hasn't you know followed the history of Japanese wrestling is there ever been anybody in the United States in the wrestling industry as over as mainstream as well known as popular in in our culture, as Inoki was in theirs, maybe Jim Londos years ago, when you know the the world title matches were reported in the newspapers, everybody knew who he was. But still, you know, was that even approaching Inoki's status in in Japan? I don't think so. He's one of the most significant and interesting figures in the history of wrestling. He's one of those few figures that you could actually say if he wasn't in wrestling, the entire business is radically changed. Yeah. He is one of the most important figures ever. And you really can't think of too many people in this culture that would, would have reached that level on a national basis. I mean, Hulk Hogan got really famous on a national basis. Hulk Hogan could never run for Congress, more than likely. Antonio well, Inoki through his own booking, made himself one of the biggest sports stars in his country and parlayed that fame into much greater fame. Yeah, you know, that's the thing is that a lot of people are going to say, oh, well, Hulk Hogan was in movies and he was on TV and blah, blah, blah. There's levels of celebrity in, in every culture, in every country. But and we're not trying to downplay Hogan. I would say the same thing about Steve Austin and The Rock, to be honest. The Rock, who now the you know the most successful movie star in Hollywood, he still is not as big, as important, as popular, as beloved, as you know thought of as Inoki was in that culture. And you know he outlasted Baba by. When Baba's, it's been 20 years since Baba passed away, right? So, I mean, Baba didn't have, I don't think, the aspirations of becoming a, a politician, and he wasn't probably as egocentric as Anoki with how he promoted himself. It was more about his company and his business rather than just me, me, me. But they were neck and neck. You know, for 30 years, but Anoki outlasted him. Anoki branched out. Anoki did other things, some successfully and some, you know, laid all kinds of fucking eggs. But he was five years younger than Baba, which is an interesting part of the story, because remember, they debuted on the same day in 1960. Yeah. They're both the prize students of Ricky Dozan, biggest star, history of Japanese wrestling, the owner of the biggest promotion or the only promotion at that time in Japanese wrestling. Baba, almost right away, Got a good push. Pretty soon after he debuted, he went to the States. Anoki hung back. Anoki was washing Ricky Dozan's back. Yeah. So I think there always was a real competition between, professional competition between Anoki and his head and Baba. Remember, Anoki quit JWA to start an opposition group in 1966, while Baba was the biggest star in JWA. And then when he comes back, that's when finally they're both in Japan. Anoki's more established. They put them together as a tag team. And for the next several years, 
the biggest thing in Japanese wrestling is Baba and Anoki as a team. And remember when there was only one promotion, they had two uh, network time slots for TV, did they not? So at, at one point, Anoki would be the star on one program, Baba would be the star on the other program. And, but they were, you know, inextricably linked with each other, and both of them wanted to go out on their own, and Noki had tried to do it first, and then ended up getting moved out when he tried to do it again, and it ended up that both of them, within the same calendar year, left to start their own promotions, and it killed the original one, the JWA. And you bring up the TV, it's important to note that when Baba leaves, after everything that went down with Anoki at the end of 71 into 72, Baba knows he has the relationship with the TV station. They want Baba more than they want JWA. Baba's the star. So having that relationship and being good with money and having his wife, I guess, in the office. Yeah. He had, and he had the, uh, the children of Ricky Dozan on his side, too, in terms of just how it looks to the public. He was ready to make his move. He was better set up. It took Anoki a while to get TV. And of course, JWA had to go out of business. You know, that's honestly, everybody talks about El Santo in Mexico. And again, same situation. He was more, and still is to this day, over and beloved and popular and mainstream in his culture in Mexico than any counterpart here in this country. But Japan had three of them right in a row. Ricky Dozan was the most single most popular sports figure in Japan in the 50s and early 60s. His two handpicked students, Baba and Anoki, become the leaders of wrestling in Japan for the next 30 years after that. You mentioned, you know, Baba immediately got a push over here because of his size. He was, nobody had ever seen a Japanese wrestler that size before, that height, and it was just freakish, and that's why he was used in main events, and Anoki was always upset about that. He got sent for his excursion to America and ended up working, you know, for 30 bucks a night or whatever for Nick Goulas in Tennessee and over in Kingsport. And, you know, he Baba he made him into the garden. Yeah. <laughs> Baba, Baba not only main evented the garden and the Olympic auditorium, New York and Los Angeles, but challenged for, two of the three major, or maybe all three of the major world titles at the time. On his trip over here, and Anoki gets, you know, it gets sent to Tennessee Purgatory to be, a, you know, another rotating unknown Japanese wrestler. So he never forgot that either. That's why 10 years later, he buys the the NWF, the Buffalo and Cleveland promotion from Pedro Martinez, so he can be the world champion of a promotion in America and use that publicity in Japan to make himself look even bigger. Later on, it actually went into the development of the IWGP. Uh, yeah, the International Wrestling Grand Prix. Uh, and, and boy, by the way, when you think about, again, the moves that Inoki was making, and nobody really in the, in the wrestling business in this country was paying attention at this time. Enoki comes over and buys a promotion in Cleveland and Buffalo to make himself the world champion. That's what, 1973 through 74? But thereabouts? Somewhere around there, it beats Johnny Powers. Right. By 1976, the, the match between him and Muhammad Ali is being advertised or talked about or publicized in every newspaper in the country here because it's Muhammad Ali but nobody knew who the fuck Antonio even the wrestling fans of those days nobody knew who Antonio Inoki was in this country because of the lack of home video television even the wrestling magazines didn't give well incredible co amounts of coverage to Japan so it was really only the diehards go ahead you have to remember too because this plays a big part in everything when Baba starts All Japan and Anoki has New Japan, there's also a shift that now you have two companies with two different styles. It's all pro yes. wrestling, but Baba was more an Americanized style of Japanese wrestling, and Anoki went the strong style, I guess is what we call it. You know, more of a Carl Gotch influence than Giant Baba had there. I don't know if I'd call it strong style now because it may 
give people the impression that it sucked with what they're seeing now. But it was, at that point, it was a pro wrestling style that tried to make things more credible to look more like a fight, like a contest, like an athletic, you know, uh, exhibition of some kind. And he used a lot more different style fighters because we mentioned Baba could get the American talent. He had the booking agreement with the NWA. That was what and, I was going to say right there. That's yeah. why he had to buy the NWF title because Baba could become NWA champion and Noki couldn't become a recognized world champion unless he made himself the champion. Exactly. But also that's why Baba's promotion and with Dorian Terry Funk being the American bookers and them getting the best NWA talent, Baba's promotion became the promotion for the premier in-ring workers and the American style. And he would send like Jumbo or Tenru or whoever his young guys were that he wanted to bring up. He'd send them to Texas to train with the Funks and send them to the Carolinas to train with the you know, the best NWA talent in the ring. And then they'd come back and they'd be prepared for that. Well, with Anoki, it, we mentioned on other programs, he had the booking arrangement with Vince Sr. for the WWF, but that didn't happen until the late 70s. And he couldn't get their world champion. And he couldn't get their world champion because Bruno was beholden to Baba. Pedro, I don't think, would have meant that much. And they got Backlund. Japan, and they got Backlund. And they had that world title change, which was only recognized in Japan. He was able to do that with Backlund. There was going to be no business with Bruno San Martino yeah. and Antonio Inoki. But, the, but, you know, but that's the thing. Since he had to use the WWF guys, he also used guys from Mexico, from Europe, Germany, the Steve Wrights or the, you know, the world of sport guys. It was a more of a melting pot of wrestling styles and combat styles than anywhere else in the world at that point because of the talent that he brought in. And Enoki had a way of presenting himself, his demeanor, his stance in the ring. He, he always was in great shape and he had credibility. Even though he'd never been a big-time shooter, or had any, you know, tremendous amateur credentials, he carried himself and he booked himself and you made he made you believe that he was this badass fighter. Not just wrestler, but fighter. And the thing with Ali, even though that went south for a while, he knew the concept would work. And then there was who Everett Eddy, the karate guy, and Willem Ruska, and all these different the martial arts disciplines the, that he would bring these guys in and have these mixed matches to prove that pro wrestling was the dominant fighting style and that he was the baddest fighter in the world. And it fucking worked and nobody else had done it at that point on any kind of organized mainstream, you know, level for any length of time. And it worked for him. And that's why, you know, I think honestly, Baba ended up realizing when he got older, especially with his size and physical drawbacks, he moved himself down the card. He put himself in the comedy match so people could see him, but he wouldn't embarrass himself. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't about keeping himself on top as the champion, in the main event. Even when Inoki moved guys like Fujinami or Kimura or whoever up to, you know, the main events, he never wanted to get out of the way. And he was always going to figure out a way to keep himself on top. It was just a difference in the way they viewed themselves. Yeah, you know, and the other thing, too, you have to remember with Anoki is he may be the single greatest example is not the word. I'm trying to think of that, exactly how to phrase this. There may be no other promoter who promoted themselves as a wrestling star more successfully than he did. True. Yes. A, a, an exemplary self-promoter. There was no Vince McMahon saying, hey, Hulkster, I think you should do this. He, he and he, sometimes he made the wrong move, but he knew what Antonio Inoki should do. He was in control of himself. And, you know, that's, that's the thing is that if it, was, if it was a situation like, okay, Big Daddy in England, you know, the brother's the promoter and it's a gimmick and there's nothing, there's no substance, but it's a craze, but, you know, 
Inoki fit the part. It wasn't like he was just pushing himself because he owned the thing. He did fit the part. Uh, he looked the part. He could work. He, you know, he could handle himself, apparently, especially <laughs> if anybody wants to have a tickle, look up the match with the great Antonio and Antonio Inoki from what was that, mid 60s? No, no, that was like 78, 79. Was it that late? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. But anyway, Antonio, the great Antonio still thought he was great. And uh, the other Antonio let him know that he wasn't. But, you know, that that's the thing. The, the impact or the influence that Anoki had on mixed martial arts. That's why there have been several books now written about the Ali Anoki match, even though it was a disaster to watch and it fell apart from being a work to a shoot at the last minute. It was the, the start of mixed martial arts in the modern era. And it wasn't even the, the like we said, the only example he was doing that and Noki was doing that with lesser known names, obviously, but in their worlds, these guys were, you know, were uh, significant fighters in their own disciplines. And as a result of that, you know, when Noki created that aura about himself, but also if it had not been for a lot of that, a lot of those guys that got involved, the world of mixed martial arts may look a lot different today because they've all had direct, you know, impact and influence on what MMA does today. All of the guys that he was, most all the guys. Maybe maybe not Leon Spinks. Maybe not Leon Spinks, that's true. But it also is something to note that later on in life, towards the end of his run as the owner of New Japan Pro Wrestling, he did do a lot of damage, many would argue, by booking his top stars, the guys that were in the process of being booked well or about to be booked well, against actual MMA guys and shoots, and his guys yeah. would get destroyed. And that helped really hurt New Japan and overall pro wrestling. It ruined the myth in Japan, that the pro wrestler was the toughest athlete in the world. In which they legitimately did think. Uh, for a period of time in the 60s and 70s, maybe the 50s with Ricky Dozan, they legitimately believed in Japan that wrestlers were the, the toughest all-around athletes. And now, again, it's, it's a tribute to Inoki and Baba and what they took that Ricky Dozan handed off to him and operated for, you know, nearly 30 years. It's a tribute to them that that's why today the modern wrestlers and the, you know, the modern really hardcore fans have such a romanticized notion of what it's like to go to Japan now or to wrestle in Japan now. Well, yes, if you're in a main event of fucking giant Tokyo Dome show, that's a big deal. But the same thing has happened in Japan as has happened in the United States. Wrestling is less important. It's more hokey and foolish. There's a lot more outlaw talent involved. Now, to add to the, to the problems, in modern Japanese wrestling, almost all the top American talent is contractually forbidden to go there rather than being brought in on a regular basis, which is obviously why you see, you know, every American, and I say American, and that counts for the people from the UK or whatever, the gaijin talent in Japan now is the guys that couldn't be signed to the big American companies, not the best of them. So I guess the point I'm making is, it's because of what Anoki and Baba were able to do with the wrestling business and establish it as a network TV property and the biggest stars as the most popular professional athletes in the country. And, you know, the business that they did, that's why the people still look on Japanese wrestling today as a, you know, a mythological place. It, of course, it's not anymore. It's the same thing, like we said, it's happened over there. It's gone to shit. But it's still from the people there and the people that experienced it during the golden 
era, you know, it, it was a it was the place to be. You made more money there at one point than you made in America. As we said, they got the pick of the absolute best talent. It was an honor to be picked to go to Japan for either Baba or Inoki. Or if some friend of yours got you a got you a tour as a favor or whatever the case. And, you know, it was it was a big deal. And but you had to have it did did what happened to Vince also happen to Anoki earlier as he got older, like you mentioned, with the destroying his own guys with the shooters and the weird hybrid shoot fight promotions that he tried to start in later years. And it, it did the same thing happen where Vince just in his own mind kind of lost it and thought, ah, I like this. Everybody else will too. You know, maybe to a point, I mean, very different people, but even like in the mid nineties, you know, when Ricky Choshu was the booker, there were still guys that may not have liked what Anoki was doing, although he was still the biggest star there. I mean, his retirement, you see those Tokyo Dome shows now, people rave about the matches and they talk about what a big deal it is. Go watch the Tokyo Dome shows with Anoki. Go watch the 98 retirement. That's 70,000 people in there. It's a whole different thing. I think with Anoki, he got swept up in everything happening with MMA. And specifically in Japan, you know, we probably can't gauge in America how big Pride was over there. And that was yeah. started by Takata. You know, that was his guy. He started Takata. So he got very mixed up in that and... I think it did a number on Japanese wrestling. You Sometimes you think, is there a way that it could have existed without doing that? And I don't know, but he got very involved with that, and he got very involved with that kind of style. So you wonder, is it just the next iteration of everything he had always been working towards in terms of strong style, or was it like Mick Jagger making a, you know, a hip-hop song? Like, oh, I'm going to try to stay with the times. There was a lot of freak happening. show matches. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. That he would go with that even more so than you would think coming from a guy with a pro wrestling background. It was just, it was, he went into the oddities period and China as a person wrestling men. And you would, th I guess maybe with the Japanese culture, that was kind of shocking enough to get over and get attention. But, um, you know, I, that, that uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm a big mark. I'd like to know what you think, because I know you're getting the tapes. I'm a big mark, to use that term, for New Japan Wrestling from, like let's say, 81 to 86, 87. Yeah. Which is that whole IWGP period, all the junior heavyweights doing their thing, which it's still maybe my favorite junior heavyweight wrestling in the history of wrestling. You had the freak shows. Andre is a heel. Hogan was coming into his own. And then into that period where... Akira Maeda and the UWF folded and Maeda came back and he has Fujiwara and Takata and everyone else and they feuded with Anoki and New Japan. That's like my favorite period of time there where he's just such a star. I mean, you watch it, you, there's no one else who's a, a level of star like he is. From the moment he comes out there walking to the ring, you brought up his intensity and just him moving around, making eye contact. Watch him making eye contact with the guys wrestling in those matches. He's staring them down before they do anything. Yeah, he, he didn't come off in any way like that, oh, we're going to have a friendly exhibition here. He looked like he was a fucking lion, you know, salivating over a fucking raw steak. And, you know, I guess that's the thing with, with those years. As we mentioned, you had such a wide variety of styles. And uh, you could see Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid. Or, again, Kobayashi and Steve Wright, who was tremendous. And some of the other, and Black Tiger, Mark Rocco, and some of those other matches. The first Japanese tape I ever saw in 1980, right after I got my VCR, I, a good probability I got it from Walt Wolanski in Philadelphia. I got 95% of my Japanese tapes from him, but it may the first one was one of Inoki's shows and one of Baba's shows, like they were on the, the weekend. Okay, so this was the weekend. And Baba's show had Funk versus, Terry Funk versus uh, Jumbo Saruta. And they go 30 minutes to a Broadway, and I'm like, this the work was inc incredible. These are two of the best technicians in the business at that time. And then you watch Inoki's show, and there's Gran Hamada in a junior heavyweight match against Babyface. Remember him, the little luchador from Mexico? Yeah. 
And the first thing is Babyface takes a bump out on the floor and Hamada runs up to the top rope, jumps off the top rope to the floor with a flying cross body two thirds way across the ring on this guy. And I'm like, holy shit, because at that time, Randy Savage would do a, the double axe handle off the top rope to the floor. And maybe every once in a while, somebody else crazy would jump and do something like that. Otherwise, you never saw that at that point in time. And it wasn't like they were doing acrobatic cheerleading routines. They were, they still didn't lose the aspect of a contest. But Inoki's in-ring of his promotion was completely different from Baba's. It was two different promotions and two different products, but it was all so fucking serious and everybody was over. And that's, you know, that's something we can't, you know, duplicate today. They were network TV stars. That's the other thing. Because remember, eventually wrestling lost network TV. They lost prime time. They lost everything they had. And yeah. that's when... That's when the company started going downhill, both companies. But Anoki and Baba were network TV stars, primetime network TV stars. I'm not sure off the top of my head how many channels they had over there at that time, but... I think there were two networks. If I'm not mistaken, somebody, one of the listeners in the cult that knows their Japanese uh, broadcasting, were there just two networks? There was As Asahi and, uh, Nippon and TV? Fuji, right? Or Nippon. Maybe three networks. Maybe so. three. <laughs> Maybe three. Well, the point is, if there were three, Baba was on one and Noki was on one of the other ones, So they and they were network TV, and there was no cable. But the here's something else, the Japanese wrestling magazines. Uh, I started, obviously, taking pictures and sending them to the Japanese magazines before I'd ever seen a Japanese match. Uh, Koichi Yoshizawa, who was one of the great correspondence back then from japan who wrote so for the magazines photos. there i have so many took pictures photos. oh yes he would send you pictures and he would send this xeroxed result sheet of all of the results from every show run in the country of japan during the period of time that it covered like once a month but they were handwritten he they didn't he didn't have a typewriter that could write in english so they were handwritten by a Japanese guy that English writing was his second writing language, and you could barely decipher it, right? And I, I'm ashamed to say that I, I think I dumped those years ago. Uh, but he started asking for my pictures, and he's the one. He was my agent for the magazine. I would send Koichi the pictures. He would give them to the magazine people. Whatever they used, they'd send me a check. One day, I, this was in 77, 78, 79. I'd get checks for $100, $150 from Gong Magazine for sending them $3 worth of fucking prints or whatever. And I, what is that in today's money? Even more is what it is. But you would see these insane scenes and these wild looking people and the photography in these magazines was better than anything in America and the printing, the paper and the full color sections. And they sold hundreds of thousands of copies of these things. Uh, remember weekly pro gong magazine. Um, they, they, the same people that published the baseball magazines published the wrestling magazines in Japan. And that was the two most popular sports. And so, you know, they sold hundreds of thousands of these things a week that were the size of, you know, they were square bound, so hundreds of pages. And it just, the wrestling mania, that was the first merchandising, right? All the guys that went to Japan got t-shirts and the fucking wrestling memorabilia was sold over there long before Vince started or anybody you know, had any ideas in this country of doing things officially licensed, but they had the network TV to push it. Even the records, remember, Terry Funk did a fucking album. If that doesn't show you that they'll buy anything with a record, I love Terry Funk, but he can't sing. Hey, we talked about Inoki buying championships, and again, he had the WWF championship briefly and created the IWGP later on. Do you remember from when you were a fan the coverage in the magazines? Because there was some in the States of him versus Strong Kobayashi. Because that was kind of a 
big deal at the time because Kobayashi had been the biggest star for IWE and he jumped to lose to Inoki. Yes, and and Kobayashi was somewhat of a name in parts of this country because he'd had a long run in the AWA and had worked few of the other territories. And I think that's Inoki, you can see going through his career and the career or the time that New Japan was under his control, he would always bring in a, a an ex-rival or an ex-competitor or somebody from another company, and they would be featured strongly, but the, the, it, invariably they would end up losing to Inoki, but he would still but he brought in and and uh, brought back to the fold a lot of those guys and figured out some way to get the most out of everybody as it related to getting himself over. And I'm trying... He got Vader I, over. Did, did Leon ever tell you about wrestling Inoki? Oh, yes, because... Well, that that was the thing, is... Remember, the two most controversial finishes that I can think of in uh, New Japan history... Well, I mean, there's the, you know, Maeda shoot kick and all that stuff. But seriously, Inoki and Hogan in the IWGP final, where allegedly, and still to this day, who, you know, is anybody definitively sure? We believe it was probably a work because it worked out so well. But Hogan knocked Inoki out unconscious with the clothesline, the axe bomber, right, that Hogan used. And Anoki's down on the floor, unconscious, gets counted out, loses. Nobody saw that coming. And that was a major deal in Japanese wrestling for decades after that. And then, like you said, when he decides he wants to make a new monster and brings Leon in to be Vader, thank God it wasn't Ultimate Warrior. That was the first pick, and that would have been abysmal. And for the record, for anyone listening, if Ultimate Warrior had not signed with Vince, he was going to be Vader. Yes. Big Van Vader. Big Van Vader. But instead it falls to Leon, and Leon was perfect for it, but Inoki did, what was it, was it three minutes? It did the job for Leon, for Vader, on his debut in three minutes in, was it Sumo Hall? Sumo Hall. Guy who never loses, loses quickly to a brand new wrestler no one had ever seen before. And the people went bullshit and it caused such a run. They set shit on fire and they threw all their seat cushions in the ring. And they, they did Japanese are not exactly like fucking Colombians when it comes to having street riots, but they tried their best. And how long was wrestling banned from the building after that for like a year or two? Oh yeah. And you see, that's heat you never had where people turn around and light their own seats on fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fuck you. We're going to light ourselves on fire. We were so pissed off about that. Uh, but it was just, it was shocking. Nobody could imagine that happened. And that was, but, but he was made, beauty. but Vader was made. Yeah. That's the beauty of when somebody protects themselves or has been protected for a long time and well, when they do go to make somebody, it fucking works. But they got to be trying to make them as well. It can't be like, oh, Hulk Hogan did a job for Kidman. Yeah. Did Vince ever talk about Inoki? Not, <laughs> See, that's the thing. I think Vince McMahon, in the last, what, 10 years, has been the American promoter that has acknowledged Antonio Inoki and his company and his legacy and his existence more than anybody else in wrestling since Anoki was actually wrestling regularly. And I got to be honest with you. I don't know that I ever heard Vince. I mean, obviously they'd done the Madison square garden series and Vince used to go over for the big, you know, events, but he never like mentioned Inoki like, Oh, that, that Antonio, what a great guy. You know, it, his name uh. never came up. I took his million dollars and I never gave him Hogan again. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to lose Andre next year too. <laughs> Boy, that was heat, by the way. A million dollars and a year later, Andre and Hogan are both fucking gone. But anyway, um, but yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we're talking about, and I know a lot of the kids out there are going to be going, oh, golly, there's Tanahashi and Okada. They're so much more popular and they're better wrestlers. Well, I'm sorry. 
I know you hate to hear this, but there is not a professional wrestler in the history, as we've mentioned, of the United States and only two in the history of Japan that can compare with the magnitude, the popularity, the recognition value, the accomplishments, the the overness of Antonio Inoki anywhere in in the world. And Santo. Santo, Ricky Dozan, Inoki, and Baba. And I know somebody's going to say, well, there was a big Peruvian hero. Well, we're getting down to fucking picking nits now, folks. Let's go with the big four. There's your Mount Rushmore of pro wrestling. The most influential, popular, successful, and ultimately well-known individuals in their culture in a sport that pretty much came from America, none of them are American. Your thoughts? You know, the other interesting thing, too, is Japan is known for having traditionally reserved fans who sit there and respectfully watch the wrestling and respectfully react to the wrestling. Go watch the reaction Antonio Inoki got. <laughs> in that, in that environment, people screaming his name, people chanting with him. He was a level of star Bigger than Baba. I mean, you have to say it. It took a while to surpass Baba, but eventually he did, and he became he much bigger there. than Baba. You'll never see another guy come along like that probably ever again. And if they do, it'll have to be a similar path. I'm going to be the promoter. I'm going to book myself, and I'm going to do it really smart. That's the only way it can happen. And then I'm going to get elected to Congress. <laughs> but no, those people, when you watch the, the videos, the people are jumping up. At, I mean, these are not like, 12-year-old girls about the Beatles. It's grown adults trembling in his presence and jumping up and down just to see him. And they hear the music and oh, yeah, they go out of their minds. And it's, you know, it, 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 I think it would have more impact on people in, in the United States seeing it if it was in the United States. Because they think, well, those crazy people in foreign countries. But no, this was... This was over, so... It'd be a bigger story in the United States if Bad News Bears 3 was a bigger hit movie. Remember they went yeah, to Japan yeah. and Anoki wrestled in it? <laughs> yes. And that was... But it, now here's the thing again. No pro wrestlers in 1976 got parts in movies in this country, pretty much. But there's Antonio Anoki pops up in the Bad News Bears Go to Japan. Uh, anyway, um... That's, you know, I mean, just read up on him or go watch some stuff on YouTube. And thankfully, the Japanese tape libraries were taken so much better care of than all the American libraries. They're still, you know, the great, they have compilation videos of the great matches of Inoki and Baba going back to the 60s that still exist because they were shot by network television and they were important at the time and they you know, kept these things, you, you know, it may be an acquired taste until you understand what everybody worked like in, in the company in, in new Japan in those days. And then you'll, you'll say, okay, I get this. And the people are fucking loving it. So we're sorry to hear about that, but, um, I guess if Anoki was five years younger than Baba, that'd be, Baba would be 84 by now. And that's wild. Here's another thing about Inoki. Did anybody ever come back from more scandals in the wrestling business or anywhere else? Not only he had wrestling scandals, he had uh, political scandals. He had, you know, some major flops. There was the embezzlement scandal because he was taking money. Wasn't it him or was it... Um, Oh, God damn. Well, Shinma took the hit. Shinma. But it was Inoki, I believe. Shinma took the hit for it and was disgraced, but there was talk by Sayama that they were taking money from the wrestling promotion to finance Inoki's cattle ranch in Brazil or whatever the fuck. Were there any... Until Vince McMahon went public and became a billionaire with the stock, Inoki and Baba were also the two wealthiest wrestling promoters in history also, right? They had more money than anybody. And obviously, Tony Khan now or Vince as a billionaire doesn't count. But in those days, they were the richest wrestling promoters in the world. 
I would have to think that's true. Remember, even someone like El Santo, no one ever talks about El Santo's great wealth or anything. Baba and Anoki, and I think Baba may have actually had more money, if I'm not mistaken. I think, well, because Anoki made some more questionable decisions. That was that Baba was the steady, quiet, you know, honest, soft spoken guy, didn't like to attract a lot of attention. Anoki's out there, you know, look at me. So, but anyway, but they both made a ton of money in their time. And Brian, that's what it's all about. That's what people want to do. They want to make a ton of money, or at least a few ounces. Well, you can do that with our friends at Prize Picks, right? I believe so. What an interesting transition <laughs> we have there. But, you know, Giant Baba used to be a pitcher for the Giants over in Tokyo. He was. The, o the o Omiuri Giants, I believe. I believe that is correct. Of course, he would leave pitching to become a professional wrestler, but perhaps he was on the mound today. How do you think someone like Giant Baba statistically would do against someone like Shohei Otani, the best pitcher in the American League? Well, since I don't know who the hell Shohei Otani is, otherwise than he so stole Giant Baba's first name, I'd say he won't do well. But what do you think, folks? Because our friends at Prize Picks will take the projections and they'll give them to you, and it's you versus the projections, and you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. It's daily fantasy the way you like to play it, and you can make entries easily on the player projections, and then you can select more or less. And if you select more, well, that means you get more. And if you select less, that means, well, you get less. Doesn't it? Or does it? Maybe I don't know how this works. <laughs> Maybe I don't even know what you said. Well, there you go, folks. Prize Picks offers projections on any sport you watch. NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college basketball, women's college basketball. They ought to have intergender college basketball. Soccer, WNBA, eSports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, Euro basketball, cricket, and the ever-popular and highly exciting disc golf. You can make entries fast in 60 seconds or less. Boy, don't you wish you could get 60 seconds or less entry to everything in your life. You can make safe and fast withdrawals. You don't even need to pull a gun or any kind of weapon. And Prize Picks is currently operational in over 30 states. That means apparently there's just under 20 that haven't got with the program and Canada. Folks, right now, download Canada. the. Yes, that's what I said. Download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com right now to sign up and play the daily fantasy sports. Everybody needs a good fantasy during the day. First time users can get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code JCE. You put in 100, they'll give you 100. You only put in 50, they're only going to give you 50. What do you think this is? Make a wish, goddamn charity. They're only going to give you what you put into it. You got to do some of the work. But folks, don't forget to enter promo code JCE at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100 and then fire away at these projections and out project them and you can win up to 10 times your money. And folks, if you know what you're doing, then go with it from there. Prizepicks.com. That's right. Win some money. Prize picks. That's right. And speaking of winning some money, if you had bet me Let's say five years ago, if you had bet me, Jim, in five years from now, there's going to be a tremendous market on Vice TV for your old pictures and video of wrestling. Do you know what I would have said to you, Brian, last? Vice TV? Is that where Action Bronson stars? I wouldn't have said that. I would have said, what the hell are you talking about, son? Why, nobody would want these old things. But now what's old is new again, and since we've got no good modern wrestling, Vice TV is coming through again with Tales from the Territory, some old vintage wrestling content that we can all enjoy, and that series starts this week on Vice TV, and today we have the creators of Dark Side of the Ring who are also behind Tales from the Territories on the program, Evan Husney and Jason Eisner, and Brian, if you can get the electronic hookup accomplished and we can get these folks on the phone then we'll talk to them about this new television program 
All right, let me get the electronics hooked up. Oh, boy. Oh, the frequency. I believe we have them on the line. All right, it's coming up this Tuesday, October the 4th on Vice TV, 10 o'clock Eastern Time. The 10-episode season starts of Tales from the Territories. And obviously, it is Tales from the Territories featuring folks that were in those territories and shot by the guys that almost brought an end to a few careers with their last uh, season of Dark Side of the Ring. And we think that this one will be received just as well, if not better. Evan Husney and Jason Eisner, the creators behind Dark Side of the Ring and now Tales from the Territories. Thanks, guys, for being on the show. Thanks for hey. having us. Thanks for having us back. And I guess we should assign, for the folks who haven't heard you speak before, Evan, you say something so they get a load of your voice since we got two guests today. All right. This is Evan right here, and <laughs> thanks for the comic, comic books I bought from you, Jim, uh, last time I was there. I appreciate that. And thank you for the rare wrestling encyclopedia that you just sent me when you sent back the pictures that I sent you to scan. And Jason, say hello <laughs> to the folks as well. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is Jason Eisner. And uh, Jim, it's been a long time since uh, I've seen you as well, too. I've missed out on the last couple trips. I know you don't come down here anymore. Is it a problem with the border or what's going on? <laughs> no, I'm like always, I get serious FOMO. I'm so jealous when I, I see the guys are there. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm blocked. I'm chained to a computer, like working nonstop 24 seven. So, um, you know, we've, we've had to split up duties as uh, the shows have gotten bigger and more shows are being made. Well, I thought that uh, actually it was usually problems on the other way crossing the border. When you got a record like you've got, it's usually you're, it's harder <laughs> to get from the states back into Canada. But nevertheless, how did you guys get in the Tales from the Territories business? Dark Side of the Ring has been the biggest hit on Vice TV for its three seasons. Yeah, uh, but this is a that's it's still the wrestling genre, but it's a departure both in style and tone and. And content. How did this episode or this uh, series idea come up? Well, uh, it was actually um, back in 2019 when this first started. Um, it was right after the first season of Dark Side of the Ring uh, had aired, finally aired. And I, I just remember, I think episode one or two had just dropped. And I was, uh, I think, at the grocery store. <laughs> I looked down at my phone and I got a notification that said, The Rock has mentioned you on Twitter which was like, oh, shit, what is this? And I and I looked down, and of course it was The Rock, you know, had just seen the first few episodes of Dark Side, and he, you know, took the time out just to, uh, you know, tweet us to put us over, to put over the show, and, and it, was, it was amazing. It was like this thing I never thought in a million years would ever happen. Um, and of course that had just come off the heels of Hulk Hogan burying us on Twitter <laughs> right after the first <laughs> episode it aired. So it was like this weird, you know, we're like at WrestleMania 18 all over again. Um, but it was cool. And so uh, it, from there, just organically, you know, it was sort of like our people and, and the rocks people sort of got together to talk like, Hey, maybe there's a, uh, maybe there's something we could do together. You know, maybe there's another show or another wrestling doc we could do. Um, and we already had the you know second season of Dark Side in development, so we were working on that. And it was obviously you know we wanted to try and think of something that we could do that was completely different. So we met with Seven Bucks, Seven Bucks Productions, uh, the uh, you know which is the Rock's uh, film and TV production company, and we just started talking. And it, it was quick. It became it was quick. You know that we decided that we had a mutual interest in wanting to do something around the territories or that era. So we started spitballing ideas. I sort of went home after that, you know, meeting and just uh, was just thinking of different ways we could format a show around the territories that wasn't like an exhaustive history of each territory, something that just allowed us the platform to bring, you know, these wrestlers together to tell crazy, wild, weird stories, like truly insane stories, because we've heard like, you know, Jason and I have heard so many of these wild <laughs> road stories, if you will. Uh, from back in those days, and 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 it, it, the territory era is usually a catalyst to some pretty wild shit. Because as you know, and I'm sure everybody listening, it's you know back when fans believed and kayfabe is at just an ultra, you know, is super enforced, and that just raises the stakes of like everything of having to live your gimmick 24/7. So 
wrestlers, especially the heels, would get into some pretty wild scenarios. And we'd heard a lot of these anecdotes along the way making the show and obviously read about them in books and shoot interviews. So we wanted just a platform for these crazy, you know, five minute punchy stories that we could reenact. And the long story short, while we Too were late. Develop- I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> while, while we were developing season two, we were working on uh, the Chris Benoit episodes of Dark Side. We had met Chavo Guerrero Jr., who was really uh, instrumental uh, in putting that, you know, putting those shows together. And he also was sort of transitioning over into working on into more TV productions. He was working on Glow. And we just hit it off with Chavo. And he also had uh, some interest in wanting to do something around these wild, crazy territory stories. So it was basically the three of us, Seven Bucks, me and Jason and Chavo kind of came together, developed the show back in 2019. We pitched it around everywhere. And then Vice came to the table, I think, uh, I think in like 2021. And then, yeah. And then, and then we decided right after season three, we would go full time into making this. Well, you know, The Rock has always been a... <laughs> for lack of a better word, a fan. And he'll say that he's a, a, a fan of wrestling and a fan of the territory days. Cause that was his childhood. That's how he grew up as folks know for good and bad. He had, you know, hard times where he was living with downtown Bruno eating toilet eggs in Nashville or whatever. <laughs> um, but he, you know, has a fond remembrance over all of those days and of the people in the business. And, you know, I've, I can see he's, he, him wanting to spotlight that. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, just going to. Yeah, no, of course. And and the fact that he grew up in it, you know, he grew up in the territory system, you know, going to these shows that, you know, that his dad was at and, you know, in Hawaii with his grandparents. So it's a huge part of his, you know, like upbringing, you know, growing up in the territories and having aunts and uncles that were wrestlers, you know. Yeah, well, yeah I can. He, he was well, very. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, he he was very inspired by the idea of doing something just on the territories and, and getting some of the old guys like back together to, you know, to tell the stories. But even when I remember when we were in prep on the show, like he, the rock was like devouring um, like documentaries about that era. Like I remember him letting us know that he was watching like the Memphis heat documentary to just like get inspired and get his head into it. So that was really cool. Well, yeah. And as well, it's great to document some of these guys not to be morbid, but what, you know, after with just the news about Antonio Inoki just yesterday. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's great to document these guys while you still can. And you sent me a preview of the first two episodes that are Memphis centric, one mm-hmm. Memphis generally. And, and second one, the, is kind of a special on Andy Kaufman and Jerry Lawler, the match, the rivalry, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And if listening to these guys tell these stories, minus a lot more profanity, it sounded like when we used to sit around in a locker room in Memphis. It's the same. They're a little bit older. But with a lot of the territories, you know, unfortunately, some of the greatest storytellers or the biggest stars or whatever have have passed on. But you guys were able to get for an an entire list of these territories, you know, everybody that you could that is still obviously around and cognizant, uh, the list is, as I said, Memphis and Kaufman versus Lawler. You've got the AWA, Stampede Wrestling, Florida, uh, Mid-Atlantic slash Crockett Promotions, Portland, Polynesian Pro, World Class, and Mid-South. Mm-hmm. And that's a heck of a cross-section of really the the seventies and eighties territories powerhouses, um, who were you surprised at the most? Because you got an eclectic group for all of these roundtables. Yeah, and I guess we it, should say that's the format: is a bunch of guys around a table. Yeah, no, yeah, we 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 totally should, uh, and and that was what really makes it different, you know, than Dark Side. Not just in the tone of just telling these, you know, wild and crazy stories, as opposed to you know, a, a sort of journalistic exploration of, you know, tragedies or controversies in the business. You know, this show is really kind of more celebratory in tone and looking at more of the just insane experiences of, you know, territory wrestlers, some who have put their lives on the line, you know, for the sake of the business. And um, and uh, for us, it was about getting wrestlers together to tell the stories, almost like a campfire style uh story time you know with with wrestlers 
in kind of a Tales from the Crypt format where it's an anthology show of these little five to six, you know, minute long stories that, you know, they're just bouncing around. And that sort of was birthed out of like, I think it it was one wrestling event I was at. I wandered into the hotel bar and I saw Road Warrior Animal, Scott Norton, Sonny Ono, uh, maybe Medusa and somebody else. And they had, you know, were a few beers in and just sharing stories, bouncing. One would inspire another one. And, oh, you know, the time that we were in Japan and da, 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 <laughs> you know. And so it would just it would just ping pong around the table with these different stories. And every one was great. And so in the back of my mind, I was like, if you could capture this on TV and it's hard because obviously I was just a fly in a wall for this very organic thing. And to, you know, put production behind it and try to recreate that is tough. But that's what. I, we were trying to do with this show. Um, and well, that's, I've always said yeah. the wrestling business is the only business in the world where when guys get together in their <laughs> senior years, they say, Hey, remember the time you broke my leg in Cleveland? Yeah. <laughs> or, you <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. I was, I'm riding a car with Ray Stevens one time. He said, let me tell you about the time I shot Don Fargo in the leg for a rib. Yeah. Exactly. And you don't, you don't hear shit like that. Uh, but with the Memphis uh, episode, obviously, being my, you know, my uh, origination, I've heard a lot of these stories. As a matter of fact, that you reenact the Randy Savage Waffle House incident that <laughs> Dutch Mantell, who is on the round table, has made famous in his book and, and has told yeah. it. And actually, I've heard it from a couple of different sides because it didn't make the final cut of your show. But Rip Rogers of uh, my old friend and partner from OVW was the guy that was with Randy that passed him the butter knife. Oh, Be because wow. Randy said, give me a knife. And the rip reached that heads in the butter knife when they're <laughs> in a waffle house. It's not Morton's, you know, you can't cut those fucking pork chops at waffle house with a knife anyway. Right. But, <laughs> but in, in, uh, but you know, these, these stories again are all true as I believe a famous movie intro once said, give or take a lie or two. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. this is the first time, I will admit, this is the first time that I've heard that Jerry Jarrett actually pulled Mario Galento's eyeball out and left it laying on the mat. Right. <laughs> because <laughs> when, when, see, but let's see, that's the thing is, again, we're not saying this is made up or manufactured. These incidents really did happen, but it's funny that everybody in wrestling has a slightly different way of telling yeah. it. Now, when Lawler wrote about it in his book, he mentioned that Galento had already lost an eye before with doing all the crazy shit he was doing, and Jarrett was going after his good eye. And he did get 200 and some stitches because he did get wailed with a, <laughs> with a billy stick on live television, and I believe... If I'm not mistaken, Tojo's wooden shoes may have come into it also. So they almost skinned Mario Galento's face off his head. Jesus But Christ. I never heard that the, the eyeball actually came out and landed on the mat. But that's what makes the story interesting, right? You never exactly know. And did they follow up the story? Because you left it after the straight race. And see, I'm going to give yeah. some teases here, folks. I'm going to give some yeah. teases. After the straight razor incident in Blytheville, uh, did they go into uh, Fargo calling him up on the phone? They didn't go into that, but they 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 went into some other story. It's like it's he's like a Rasputin kind of character. He keeps coming back, you know. Um, and and I think there was one other time. So yeah, he he you know jumps Jerry Jarrett during the match that's that's number one you know and then mario galento he comes back with the straight razor to attack lawler and then there was a third instance where um mario galento and his wife i think were seen at another event in the in the crowd smoky and had a, yeah and he had a gun with him or something no and she no she had it she because had it, right. everybody knew see right. here's the deal he married this girl and he didn't smarten her up and the, her name is Smokey Galento. I can't remember what her given name Smokey was. Smokey Galento. Wow. But the the um, uh, the boys knew, and it spread around that she would sit front row and cheer him on in his matches for real, and she had a gun in her purse. Amazing. And wow. and then um, <laughs> you know if if things it came out on more than one occasion if she thought that he was getting a, a raw deal. 
And from what I can determine from the people talking about Galento and reading his own publicity, and he authored his own autobiography or maybe told it to somebody, I'm not sure if he was that literate, I don't know that he was ever all the way smart to the business. And if he he was smart Whoa. enough to the business the way that they conducted it in the Tennessee area back in the days before television, because he was a Roy Welch protege. So that meant you were barely smart because, you know, most of the time shit, as they mentioned with Galento, he would settle shit with a blackjack or the wife with the gun in the purse or coming at you in the parking lot or whatever. And Jeez. he was an odd case. <laughs> but after that happened with them, Jason Lawler with the switchblade. And then it was Jim White, by the way, Lawler's partner in 1973 that put the big 357 Magnum in, in between Galento's eyes and said, get the fuck out of here. Well, Jackie Fargo hears about that. And he was Lawler's mentor and Lawler was his protege. So he had known Galento for years. He called Galento up on the phone and told him that if he fucked with his boy Lawler again, he was going to kill him. Well, then apparently Galento called the cops on Fargo, and there's newspaper back and forth on the the court cases between Galento and Fargo, Fargo threatening to kill him. And it just, it went on and on. Yeah, Mario Galento was a, there may be Dark Side of the Ring season four or five for you, because we, we know yeah. four is coming up. Yeah, but, well, I mean, there, there's a lot more to that story, and obviously... You know, like like I was saying, it kept going, and there was another story about yeah, Smokey Glento bringing the gun to the, I think to like to the arena, and then somebody else got involved and put a knife up to Mario's neck and was like, don't ever, don't you ever come back here again, because they thought he was going to attack the wrestlers again yeah. or something, yeah. <laughs> something like that. So, but obviously, you only got so much time to tell it in the in the in the show. Um, but what's really interesting, just to go back for a second about um, that story and how the telling of these tall tales evolves over time. You know, and that is a huge part of this show. And you're going to see it a lot in the season where, you know, some folks at the table might be making some eye gestures or might be <laughs> questioning, you know, questioning some of the stories along the way. And I think that's part of the fun because, I mean, these stories happened 40 years ago. They are road stories, war stories, and things do get exaggerated, especially in an environment where, you know, folks at the table are going to be a little competitive with their stories in, in some yeah. cases. And I think that's I think that's fun. Like, for example, Jim, if you were at that table, if you were on that round table and heard the Galento story, would you have would you have called out Jerry on those details? Oh, my God. How can I call out the God of wrestling, Jerry Jarrett? Here I am. <laughs> this little Diminutive Jim Cornette. No, I'd, I'd have sit there and nodded if it was. Jim. Yeah. <laughs> In some cases, you got you got to pick your fights, you know. But right. I'll tell you what, though, I would have if because there was a story that Lawler told about road stories and ribs, and the Tennessee territory was ground zero for most ribs and road stories that involved driving and cars and things like that because it was constant. Is 300 miles every day of the week, every week, every etc. Right for 20 years, some of those guys. So they were master. The Fargos were masters of having naked midgets in a trunk at a toll booth. I mean, just anything to get a rise out of people. But the Kamala story, Lawler left one thing out, or maybe the editing did it. It's it was it's it's the punchline of the story. No, y'all come on. Have. Well, then he did for you know. I guess he figured well, you know, in this day and age, but. Here's the thing. He's got the blue light and he's got the loudspeaker, you know, the megaphone or whatever, like the fire department uses. And he's pulled Kamala over on the side of the road in the interstate in Tennessee in the early 80s. And Kamala's riding by himself. And he's OK, get out of the car. Now face away from the car. Back up toward me. That whole thing is true, right? But then he, what he left out was he starts frisking Kamala. And Kamala's standing there. He's got this copy thing behind him. He's got his hands up and the guy's frisking him around his, his ribs and then, you know, around his pockets and everything. And then all of a sudden Kamala feels the cop reach one hand between his legs and grab him by the dick and balls. Oh my. <laughs> and that's when Kamala looks down and says, Oh, King. <laughs> <laughs> 
Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, that was nope. definitely not. Uh, that was not included in his telling of the story. Yeah, he got a he got uh, some Ugandan headhunter there, but um, but anyway, you know that's that's the thing, and especially the the episode on the Lawler Kaufman program. You know, a lot of people may think because of the way that they look at wrestling these days that, oh, that's bullshit. They didn't just do that week to week and just, hey, here's an idea. And no, that's what it was, especially in the weekly territories in those days. Every week, it was it was improv. They felt it as they went. Mm -hmm. And there was such a lack of, I'm not saying there wasn't ever plans, but there was such a lack of minute you know, production of everything and just producing all the life and the energy and the spontaneity out of, out of everything like today, that that's why, you know, people more than whether the guys were good workers or more than whether the guys shit looked good in the ring, it looked so spontaneous because so much of it was that that's why people could be swept up in it. Do you, do you get that impression as you go back and look at Today's product versus your research from these tales of the territories. Oh, my God. A hundred percent. I mean, one of the things that's so cool about the Kaufman Lawler thing, and Jason, feel free to chime in, too, is um, the idea of, yes, there's a lot of sort of Ocean's Eleven planning going into this angle and sort of putting it all together. And it's very elaborate in some cases. But then in the same token, there a lot of it's improv and a lot of it's spontaneous and a lot of it is feeling, you know, in the moment of, you know, really uh, what's going to make this angle that much more real or, 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 you know, there's a lot of spontaneity with it, especially with like, you know, when Lawler slaps Kaufman on, uh, on, uh, on David Letterman, he didn't even know yeah. he was going to do it until he did it. So there's a lot of elements of it that are just being in the moment and feeling out that storyline and and with that sort of agreement of we're going to perpetuate this you know at all costs no matter what happens um and so i really appreciate that and i think also what's great about this angle and why we kind of devoted a whole hour to it which was not planned that was something that was very organic and just happened on the fly where we were filming with the guys for the memphis episode and i thought we were just going to get little pieces of the of the whole um, Andy Kaufman story that we'd be able to sprinkle into the Memphis episode. But then they just told the whole story from top to bottom. And then when we got back, I was like, oh, my God, this could be a, a full episode. And um, for me, it just it's such a emblematic angle of the territories. It's It just speaks to so much of like how elaborate it was, how much of it was improv, like I said. Um, but it's just a great deconstruction of a great territory angle and how far both parties, Kaufman and Lawler, took it. You know, and like kayfabe to the grave. I mean, you see when yeah. Kaufman died, you know, like when he passes on, they interview Lawler and he's like, well, you know, it's always sad when people die, but I, I didn't like the guy very much. You know, and he says that when the guy dies and you yeah. never see that today. And I think that it speaks a but lot. You know to what? The there's there's so much yeah. honesty in that, because if that's yeah. really what happened and those two had felt that way about each other, that's really what you would say if you were being honest, right? Oh, hundred percent. Like it, it, he has a great anecdote where he says, uh, where, where, where Jerry Lawler says, if, uh, I hope when I die, you know, they don't interview Jimmy Hart, you know, someone who doesn't yeah. like me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I'm being, I don't know why I'm commenting on this. You know, it's great. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. But I think it's the art form, especially in the territory era. It's that art form of staying in the gray area of staying, blurring the lines and keeping fans there. Like sometimes fans might think some of this is, is not altogether authentic, but if you can create the sense of doubt, you know, and, and people aren't sure what's real and what's not. And I think, uh, that's the lost art form, especially with comparing it to modern wrestling, you know, in terms of that. So that was very eye opening. I think very cool to see with that Kaufman episode. Yeah. And, and look how far like Kaufman, like took it to even, uh, not even smarten up his own parents to what was happening. Like yeah. Jerry Lawler talks about how, uh, Andy Kaufman's parents were so angry with him and they thought that he actually like broke uh, Andy's neck. Um, so yeah, just to see like how far, you know, they would take it. Also, I love the moment. There's this moment Jerry talks about too with the, with the David Letterman slap um, incident is that like they had like, they had talked about the idea of Jerry slapping Andy on TV, but decided not to go with it, go, go with it. 
but when they were in the moment, Jerry just like looked at Andy with just like a look, didn't say yeah. anything, but they could just read each other's like eyes. And, uh, and you just get a sense that they knew almost kind of like this Jedi sort of feeling what was about to happen. And that, you know, created yeah. such a magical moment that, you know, it was a huge moment for wrestling, but it was just like, you know, it was done in the heat of the moment, which is so cool. Well, you know, the, the thing is, the reason why, I've, and I've always thought, and now that everybody's talking about this 40 years after the fact, uh, because of its seminal nature in celebrities and crossovers and wrestling and everything, but Vince Sr. thought, well, this will make wrestling look phony and silly. And right. ultimately, it made more people believe <laughs> wrestling, or at least something about wrestling, than anything else that anybody's done in the last 40 years. And mm -hmm. case in point, with the average person, uh, it happened in Memphis, wrestling obviously huge in Memphis. My cousin and his wife at the time lived in Memphis. And since I was still a photographer, when I would go down there, I would stay with them to avoid having to buy a hotel room, right? So mm -hmm. that night, I shot the pictures of the match. I go back to my cousin's house and his wife comes in. She was a nurse at the hospital that they took Andy Kaufman to that night. And she was the head nurse on the floor or whatever. And she obviously, I didn't sit them down and say, okay, here's the complete way wrestling works, right? I didn't smarten them up like that, but they knew because they knew me and they mm. saw what they saw on television. They, okay, something's going on here. They were never wrestling fans. They knew mm. it was obviously in some way uh, choreographed or manipulated or whatever, but that's all they knew. But Terry, his wife, comes in and says, well, boy, they really hurt Andy Kaufman tonight, huh? I said, yeah, Lawler gave him the pile driver, two pile drivers. Everybody at the hospital bought it because there had been Lawler on the local news, not the wrestling program, but interviewed on the local news saying <laughs> he's making fun of my business and I think I have to hurt him. That's and amazing. then to begin with, it's a network TV star that's doing this to begin with. And then <laughs> who in the world would think that a network TV star would go to the hospital if he didn't need to in Memphis? True. From a wrestling pile driver. So yeah. everybody bought it. Yeah. And isn't there some truth to the fact of like, because there's a little reference of it in the episode, you know, when, when Jerry Jarrett talks about hearing from Bill Watts after, after, yeah. <laughs> after, after, after uh, Kaufman's in the, in, in the hospital, you know, Bill Watts talks to Jerry Jarrett on the phone and basically says, I'm so proud of what you and Lawler did to that, you know, asshole who's making, a mockery of our business, you know, or whatever. And, but isn't there some truth to the fact that like, they really had to work everybody, you know, Jerry Jarrett and Lawler, everybody and Kaufman had to work everybody in the business because there was that stigma that if they did let everybody in on it, that it would have the appearance like, Oh, this guy from the outside's coming in and he's going to make, you know, he's going to make a mockery of our business, you know, even if he is part of the angle. So we have to kind of protect it even from everybody in the wrestling business. Isn't there some, truth to that well let's let's put it this way I, i'm pretty sure as soon as watts because watts saw the associated press or the national news or whatever that it got it was in sports illustrated it was everywhere the next day or two right that's yeah, yeah. before internet and even you know wrestling news or any other kind of news except in the newspaper or television didn't move that swiftly you had to talk to somebody on the phone or you know wait for something in the mail so my guess is that Watts was probably not happy a few days later or whenever he actually talked to somebody that was on the card that night because all the boys at the time knew it was a work. It couldn't possibly not be a work in, in you know, just in, in our world, right? They knew sure. when Lawler set him down safe with a pile driver, it was a work. Sure, sure. But at the same time, Andy wanted to play with it a little bit, and so then... When he went to the hospital, they're like, did he really get hurt? But uh, yeah. they knew the origination was a work. Right. But then they tried to keep the, uh, you know, the the injury a little more mystifying. But uh, it's, as it got around the wrestling business, and remember, this is the days the guy's still kayfabed. 
Mm-hmm. It wasn't like today where everybody has to go spill their guts on Twitter. Right. So uh, most of the people in the business knew that Andy was working with Lawler and working in wrestling. It wasn't a complete shoot, especially when he came back after that. Now, the the matches with the women were complete shoots. Yes. And so that was, and even in on in the Coliseum and even with Foxy, the rematch, they never smartened Foxy up. We talked about this when you guys were down here. Yeah. She she really thought she had a chance. Lawler had pumped her up, right? She almost got him. Yeah, I know. Um, but so so that's the thing is it was a gray area, but even the guys in the business were like they didn't know the extent of how to which Andy would go right. to get this thing over or to continue or to to prolong it. And it well, it because I guess you'll probably you probably came away from a lot of these interviews with the sense that a lot of the guys in the particular territories, because of the nature of the beast in those days, had no idea what was going on in the other territories because they mm-hmm. were working seven nights a week, doing their own TV once a week, uh, in, in their own programs. There was no, as the as the boys started calling them dirt sheets or uh, the newsletters until very early on in the 80s, there, you know, there wasn't really a way to keep up unless you talk to other guys in the business in other territories. But then, mm-hmm. you know, the next generation got in that were in video came along and it was easier to keep tabs on people, but you've got an eclectic group for a lot of these episodes. Who are some of your favorite groups? Oh man. Well, the Memphis group was great. I mean, everyone has such great chemistry, you know, um, at that table. And that was a huge, part of the show like the whereas dark side you know you're doing these one-on-one interviews um and you know you don't have to rely on you know one interview you can always you know rely on the you know the storytelling of a lot of different voices and cut to them and whatnot making this show it kind of lives or dies with the chemistry of the table you know so you're really it's kind of a high risk show in a lot of ways so so we really had to curate those tables um you know, as best we could in terms of, you know, a, who's still around. Um, but just sort of researching their stories ahead of time. We, we talked at length to everybody on the show well in advance before they actually appeared on the show, uh, just to make sure we knew what stories we were going to get and then to try and get all of the details of those stories so we could reenact them and things and so on and so forth. Um, and then it was also about like who gets along with each other, you know, because, (laughs) There's a lot of configurations in this episode or a lot of different other people we could have had. And but then I don't want to sit next to so and so and I ain't talking to yada, yada, you know, whatever. So there was a lot of that to kind of play with. Um, But my favorite to answer your question, uh, the Memphis group was great. I really loved the Florida group. I thought the Florida group was a lot of fun. Uh, It was uh, Gerald Briscoe who we've never had um, on dark side before or anything. So it was amazing to work with him. He's incredible. It was uh, Kevin Sullivan uh, as well. It was Steve Kern, um, Bob Roop, which was cool to have on the show and, and Brian Blair. And those guys just had great chemistry, you know, lots of stories batting around a lot of stuff. We didn't really account for just cause you know, so- sometimes there'll be just an organic story that'll pop out of nowhere. That'll wind up in the show. And it was cool. And that has another, that episode has another great deconstruction of a, of a pretty uh, heated territory angle, which is the story between, you know, re- taking real life and working it into the, you know, working it into the angle is, uh, is the whole Bob Roop, Steve Kern, uh, conflict, you know, yes, because you know Steve Kern has a father who was a POW, I think, in two different wars, which is insane. But his his father, when he came home from Vietnam after being, you know, a prisoner of war for, I don't know, whatever six seven years, they of course worked that into the angle. They got Bob Roop to play the kind of almost Trumpian heel that is like, if you're a POW, you're a coward, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and it created some real heat with the locals because you had local military folks showing up in full fatigues, you know, that were threatening to blow up Bob Roop's house with an anti-tank grenade. And I think he had a gun pulled on him in the parking lot over this. So that was cool just to kind of get into that whole angle, something you don't hear about too much these days. Um, and lots of funny rib stories, obviously, you know, Briscoe pulling some funny ribs on guys who were at the table, <laughs> which is funny. Um and so that that was just a great group of people for sure. Um, uh, the 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 AWA panel was interesting, Jason. Would you yeah. Say? Oh yeah. 
<laughs> that was one of my favorites because we had Greg Gagne, Medusa, uh, DDP, and Jim Brunzel, and uh, one of my favorites, Ken Patera, who's uh, quite the storyteller. Uh, but quite I think character. Yeah, that was like one of the first stories. Uh, his story, the infamous story of of uh, like Ken Patera is involved in with. Uh, a boulder going through a, a <laughs> McDonald's window one night after uh, he was looking for some cheeseburgers after uh, <laughs> I, under, I understand he happened, he happened to be driving by and saw that incident. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and that's a, a great example of a story that like, like, as you said, you know, everybody's off in different territories around the country, but I feel like that story made it around to every locker room in, in wrestling. Uh, at that time, because it, it was in a lot of the newspapers, but it's definitely one of those lore sort of tall tales that everybody heard. I heard that the boulder was so and so big and all this happened, you know, and beat up X amount of cops. So that's a story that definitely has evolved over time. Hey, and that's li a literally, literally less than a year before that incident happened. He was down in Memphis and they asked me to drive pick Patera up and drive him over to Jonesboro for his, the show on Saturday night. Cause he was in from out of town, didn't have a car. Okay. Absolutely. And we're driving down the road. And I asked him one time, I said, Ken, I said, as strong as you are, I said, did your, did your temper ever get the better of you? He said, Oh, I've turned over a couple of Coke machines in my day, but nothing Jeez. serious. And I swear to God, the next year he's going to prison. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's a interesting dynamic at the table because, um, You'll see kind of everyone's reaction to his version of the story, um, which is which is fun. And um, and yeah, it's 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 a pretty crazy story. But it was a it was a absolute pleasure, I will say, for Jason and I to build a full scale uh, period uh, accurate McDonald's facade, uh, <laughs> which we yeah. did for this uh, show. And, you know, you don't get to do that all the time um, every day. So that was fun. And uh, we really threw a we through a boulder through a real window in order to do uh this shot so Ooh, yeah and we almost destroyed our camera too it we went did. through the window and then went <laughs> through the plexiglass that we had in front of the camera and it just oh, yeah. smashed right into this camera yeah we almost destroyed like a sixty thousand dollar camera like oh uh, but it was worth it for this story because it great sure story. was it looks great you yeah. guys will pour any amount of money and sweat and blood into your art. Um, you've got a Crockett Promotions roundtable, and I, it was some interesting characters there. Include, I think uh, I remember Arn Anderson's on that one. David Crockett's yep. a part of it, right? Yeah, Baby Doll. And uh, we also got Ricky Morton first time in front of our cameras, which was great to have him. Um, and we should also say, Jim, uh, you as well. Uh, but... You didn't quite make the roundtable trip, right? Well, that's true. I, I, I mentioned that on the program last week. You did the roundtables okay. in Los Angeles and Atlanta, and both of them are not Louisville, Kentucky. So I was, <laughs> so I was not a part of that. But uh, you have shot me. Yes. Uh, filled me full of lead. You did. Now you've shot yep. me, and and also, but I, I said, let somebody else be the star on Vice TV for once. Heaven's sake, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> just you know, hog everything all to myself. But um, but I've enjoyed. Be, well, well, I was gonna I, say it, it, it would have been a crime though to not have your to not have you on a on a show about the territories. So we had to figure we had to bend the rules a little bit for you. Well, thank you. Well, and I got bent, and I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but uh, and I chimed in with a few things. Uh, but also I've enjoyed uh, because I was a fan of all these guys on the Memphis Roundtable, and I was a fan of most of the guys on the other round tables, everybody mostly preceded me in the business. So I enjoy, uh, also, as I mentioned, what I've been doing is, is helping you guys dig up some video and I have thousands of pictures of odd people yes. from various stages in the wrestling business. And we've been providing those and I've enjoyed that too. Cause that way I'm contributing like I used to back in the old days when I was just a lowly boy photographer. Um, yeah, who's incredible your stuff of yours in there. Thank you for that. Well, no worries. I'll you'll get my bill later on. Um, who? Wh what's a surprise episode? I will say that, um, and obviously Polynesian Pro is near and dear to the Rock's heart. Yeah. Uh, for obvious reasons, but most people, uh, especially the modern fans, may know the least about that promotion than they do these others because it's been covered less. So yeah. 
those stories may be new and shocking to the fans. No, 100%. Uh, that's definitely feels like the deepest cut episode. Um, and that was cool because we got um, Rocky Iakea, who's King Curtis Iakea's son. Um, and he tells all, he puts he puts the whole territory in perspective, brings a lot of the history to the territory, the the lineage, you know, of Peter Maivia, Liam Maivia. Um, and you also and we also got Lars Anderson on the show, uh, <laughs> which is which is that, great. That's going to be great. That's going to be. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So it was cool to hear from him. He was kind of Leah's right hand man for a while there. Um, and he tells the story from his perspective of the of the um, FBI extortion trial that, you know, Leah was a part of and uh, how many close brushes with death that Lars had <laughs> during that time being beaten up and almost thrown into the ocean there a few times. Um, and you also um, uh, get to hear from Kevin Sullivan is also actually Kevin Sullivan is our he, we actually double dipped on him. So he's in two two episodes on this series. He's in Florida and the Polynesia one because he spent, I think, almost a year in the territory. Um, and we also had downtown Bruno, who who uh, spent some time over there. And that's kind of how he forged his relationship that he has still to this day with Dwayne. But of course, you know, Dwayne's family as well. And so that's that's kind of cool just to hear from him and his perspective. And he's a great guy, obviously, great storyteller. Um, but there's a riot story. There's a fan riot story uh, during this uh, match between King Curtis and Neff. Uh, is it is it Neff Maivia? Is that right? Is that what they call yes. him? Yes. Uh, right? Okay, yeah. Th there was an angle between them, a match that was like it's the craziest riot story I think we have in the entire series in the entire first season here. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. That, that, that story definitely was like, Holy shit. I don't know if you know that one, but that was crazy. Um, so you'll hear a from that. a King, a King Curtis riot story. You're going to have to narrow it down a little bit more, but we'll <laughs> find out on the episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then of and, course, and, and yeah. did you reenact a uh, mad dog opening the door on the airplane in the AWA episode? Well, of course. Um, so, uh, and, and that was great. Cause we, you know, you, you did a great interview with, with Greg Gagne a few years back. And, uh, that's a, that we saw that telling of it. He, he tells it very well on that, on that, uh, interview you did with him. And we, that was another story that we had heard so many times in passing in other places. And we thought that that would just be ripe for this show. That's like kind of the archetypal story almost for the series, you know, is yeah, it's a it's a road story. You know, you have you have Mad Dog Vashon who has an entire pharmacy inside of him, you know, at that point. And uh, you know, he's been drinking, smoking weed, taking pills, and they gotta get him on Vern's, you know, plane to get him back back home. And it was a low altitude plane, which is a detail of that story that gets overlooked because I think a lot of people are like, well if he opened the plane door, wouldn't they all be dead? But I, I it's not no, a pressure. It's, it's like plane. a private plane that the boys used to take in the yeah, you know 40 sure. years ago not a goddamn delta 747 exactly see see that that's the great thing about these wrestling stories nobody disputes that this actually happened the bone of contention is everybody that was involved or anywhere around claims that they gave mad dog something and it was <laughs> always something did. different right so <laughs> nobody knows what he was really on or how many things or who really gave him something yeah. But the only disagreement is, is that everybody argues that they're the one that gave him the most potent, <laughs> you know, uh, thing that fucking sent him over the edge. Yeah. And Jason, you got to speak to this, too, because it was it was so fun. We had a great actor playing Mad Dog and we just went to town with that scene. And we actually got we got we got a uh, uh, a, a Navajo chieftain. We got the actual plane <laughs> and yeah. we, we we set it up on an airstrip. Go ahead. No, yeah, we we actually got the plane, and I remember like the guy we got it from was like very protective of it. Obviously, it's all <laughs> a very old plane. But when we were doing the episode, like Greg happened to tell the story because when you bring up that plane, it's also nicknamed Suicide One, uh, I think, because of all the near death experiences that have yeah. happened on it. Um, but like Greg's telling that story of Mad Dog opening the door and he finishes it and he's like, oh, I got this other story. Oh, wait a minute. That's too much for te television. I can't I can't say it on television. And everyone's like, are you kidding? 
you got to tell the story. And so he tells a story of how they were up in the air and Adrian Adonis like had to go number two, like seriously bad. And they couldn't wait to <laughs> like it. And so Bobby Heenan's on the plane and he gets the idea. Well, what if I just stick a garbage bag up to your ass and you just, you know, you go oh. that. And then he ended up having like explosive diarrhea that just <laughs> shot everywhere. And that was, I guess a little nerve wracking because we had, we had to cover our actors and, you know, and fake yep. shit. And, and, poor you know, guy's and guys playing, obviously getting covered in it. And we're shooting leap blowers like all around inside of it. So I haven't heard from the guy since, and maybe our production has, but uh, so, sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We went to town with that plane for sure. Oh, yeah. well, yeah. at least it was, it was movie poop instead of real yeah. poop. <laughs> wasn't shoot poop. It wasn't shoot poop. Wasn't shoot poop. It was working poop. <laughs> Holy mackerel. Well, boys, you've done it again. And hey, <laughs> before we let you go, though, you got to clear up something else. Dark Side of the Ring season four is being planned as we speak. Is that not correct? Well, you know, we can't give the official, uh, you know, wait for the press release and or, or, ah, or oh, okay. wait for it's, the announcement. It's, it's nay. That's okay. It's nay on the O'Shea. <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to get well, into no, trouble. There's been, a, there's been a lot of people go, well, it was canceled. Well, it was, it's oh, been yeah. done away with. It's been buried as a time capsule under the Smithsonian. Uh, yeah. It's still, it's still breathing. It's, it's out there breathing. somewhere ready to drop the strap and make a comeback when the time is right, right? Yeah, yeah, because uh, I, I think it's one of your lines uh, where uh, I think you say, uh, um, how will they miss you if you don't go away, right? Boom! So, um, uh, I think, I think, you know, for me, it was like after season three, we had territories lined up. It was like, we, we, like, we knew we were going into that and it would have been impossible to do both shows at once. Maybe now it would be more possible now that we've established what it is. Cause we did, we're still trying to figure out what it is and trying to workshop setting up a whole new series. So we just decided that we wanted to devote, uh, to devote all of our time to that and to getting it off the ground, making sure it was good. And, you know, and then we can, you know probably you know create a factory around that show and then be able to make both series at the same time so we so we took the time for that and now we're you know we definitely have plans to get back in the dark side we want to we're in we're we're in the you know deal making uh sort of uh discussion phase of getting it officially off the ground but there are talks right now it's not going anywhere we don't want it to go anywhere at least and so you'll you'll probably hear very soon uh the future uh, the the um, official future of Dark Side. Now I know when I say that, it's going to be all of the, all of you know you know your 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 uncles and cousins blogs, wrestling blogs are going to be popping up here with Google alerts and everything that it's coming back. But you know just well just that's because everybody fish. listens to us. That's what I'm saying. Yes. So. But well, so so temper expectations, ladies and gentlemen. But there's still some life in the old girl for right now. Yeah. It's, it's oh, yeah. yes. Very and we always got to be coming up with ideas for future episodes, just in case. Yes. Love that. Of course. <laughs> wink, wink. Yeah. Wink, wink. Nah, a wink's as good as a nod to a blind man. Well, nevertheless. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, the show that we do have coming up that we got to watch, and thank goodness we have it to watch, because holy mackerel, the modern wrestling ain't giving us any enjoyment these days but uh, it starts this tuesday october the 4th on vice tv at 10 o'clock eastern time tales from the territories from the production company of the rock and the brains of evan husty and jason eisner episodes on memphis awa stampede florida mid-atlantic portland polynesian pro world class and mid-south with a cast of literally dozens by the mm. time you add all those up, mm -hmm. probably at, at least 40. <laughs> and uh, me too. More. Yeah, close. Yeah. More. There. Just... Well, you know, I'm bad at math. Yeah. Uh, but more and me too as well. And you can't beat that with a stick. Guys, any closing <laughs> thoughts on the program or what you hope that the people will feel about it? Oh, I, 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 I hope people dig it. And, you know, I think the one thing for me is, um, you know, it's not definitive. Don't expect the Ken Burns uh, approach to the history of the territories. This is a vehicle for crazy, wild stories. 
uh, you know, we definitely want to be able to come back to these territories in future seasons, especially Jim, wink, wink, nod, nod, where <laughs> we can, you know, do do Memphis in season two, uh, all, you know, all over again with a new host of people, different stories, or or we can go to Mid South again, tell a whole different bunch of stories. So it's just a vehicle to be able to get people together again, to have them share their stories. Hey, some of these wrestlers haven't been in the same room with each other in over 35 years. I think in the world class episode. It was like Kevin Von Erich and Brian Adias hadn't seen each other like in 35 years or some crazy shit. So, oh my god! Uh, it's re- yeah, it's 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 pretty cool. So um, yeah, just enjoy it, have fun with it, and um, we'll we'll get back to our other business uh, very soon. Well, you better. And I don't know why you're not doing all these programs at the same time. Every time I see you guys, you're just sitting around. You have nothing <laughs> going on. You're not working hard at all. Nothing to occupy your time. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Evan Husney and Jason Eisner, Tales from the Territories this Tuesday, Vice TV, and more Cornette on Vice TV will be coming up in the weeks to come, and we'll talk about that. And uh, Brian, what in the world are we going to follow this with? Well, there it is, Jim, your conversation with Jason Eisner and Evan Husney. Of course, the new season coming up, you'll be featured on it, and you seem rather intrigued by some of these stories. Well, you know, and there's so many, like they said, they could actually do a second season because there's endless stories. But one of the deals that Jerry Jarrett was involved in, not with Mario Galento, some about TV stations. A lot of things in Tennessee happen at TV stations. That's where a lot of the the guys got together back in the days when the locker rooms were separate. You had baby faces and heels that never actually saw each other in the arenas except for in the ring. So they got no private time. There was a deal in Louisville, Kentucky, in I believe it was, oh gosh, it was 1973. I think it was summertime. And one of the preliminary matches was Tojo Yamamoto versus Dandy Jack Donovan. And Dandy Jack Donovan had been a a journeyman. He was featured in different places, but not like a huge main event star. But it was just a preliminary match. And of course, Tojo was figured into the Tennessee Territory, not only as he started out in the 60s as a heel and then became a babyface, teamed up with Jerry Jarrett, one of, the, one of the icons of Tennessee wrestling in the 60s and 70s, Tojo Yamamoto and Jackie Fargo and, you know, guys like that. So Tojo was going over and nobody's around these days that was actually there then so nobody really knows what happened but the story was that somewhere or another they got sideways in the ring and after tojo had won the match apparently jack donovan either allegedly attacked him tried to go for his eyes whatever and there was a bit of a skirmish and they got separated and that it stewed overnight And on Wednesdays, the guys in those days went to the TV station in Nashville to do promos for all the towns. And that was really one of the only times that the the guys on the Memphis end, the Memphis circuit, were together with the guys from the Birmingham end, the, the circuit that Nick still controlled, Nashville, Chattanooga, Birmingham, even though Jared had opened up Memphis and Louisville and Evansville, et cetera. There was two crews. And Lynn Rossi was the booker for Nick. He had been the all-American babyface hero for Nick Goulas going back to the late 50s, early 60s. And there was heat between him and Fargo because they were completely opposite individuals. But Fargo was the, the main event attraction that Rossi was at some points in some of the towns, but couldn't really be in Memphis or overall. So... Jarrett, Tojo, and Fargo, they get together at the TV station and they're waiting for Jack Donovan because whatever the fuck he'd done to Tojo had created an impression that they wanted to get even for. For the record, if I could jump in for a second, Jack Donovan's side of the story, because remember, a lot of this years later played out in Scott Teal's Whatever Happened To. Yes. He said Tojo was being especially stiff with him and uncooperative in the match. It wasn't like... Okay, I've had enough. I'm going for your eye. There were several things that led to that moment. It wasn't yes. just I'm going to be a bully after this match or anything. Well, and and that's and like I said, nobody is still around that knows exactly what started it or what happened. And there were two sides to it. But unfortunately, in this one, <laughs> Jack Donovan was was alone in his thinking, and Lynn Rossi 
tried to get to him to warn him, apparently, but it was too late because Tojo and Jarrett and Fargo got him in one of the bathrooms. All the good shit happened in the TV station in the bathrooms. And Tojo had his wooden shoes. And I know, again, people now are going to, what the fuck, wooden shoes, the Japanese wrestler, the stereotypical wooden shoes, and the kimono that he would wear to the ring. As a heel, he'd use the wooden shoes to fuck the baby face. As a baby face, he would use the wooden shoes to get back at the heels, you know, in a big schmoz, but he could also use those wooden shoes on marks because they were giant blocks of wood. And they used the wooden shoes on Dandy Jack Donovan and apparently beat him to the uh, almost the point where he didn't make it. Didn't they rip his nose off or almost rip his nose off with the wooden shoe? It it well, it was still attached, but not all the way. So anyway, anyway at that point, then Lynn Ross, everybody else tried to get him out of there because now they've got blood all over the fucking walls of the TV station bathroom there that they're in. And that was Jack Donovan's notice from the territory. He got the fuck out of there. And the ill will perpetuated, as as you mentioned, and uh, later, in 20 years later, he was still doing interviews going, I don't know what the fuck was going on. But but that's, and uh, again, somebody said uh, when they saw the preview of Jerry Jarrett, maybe or maybe not pulling Mario Galento's eyeball out. Oh, bullshit. The cops would have been called. Everybody would have gone to jail. No, I mentioned in the interview, Mario Galento calling the cops on Jackie Fargo. That was a, a very unique occurrence. Uh, just because most of the time the guys didn't want the cops involved because then it goes to the papers. Then there's some talk about wrestling being a work or not. And it opens up a whole can of peas. So which Galento didn't good, care about because he already well, went on the radio. Yeah, Galento was already on the outs, wasn't being booked, had felt like he had been, you know, blackballed or whatever. So he'd already been trying to stir things up, going on the radio, saying that business was a work and et cetera, et cetera. So that wasn't something that was going to motivate him. But in most cases, guys settled it themselves one way or the other, and the losing side left the territory. And that's what happened there. And Jack Donovan never worked the Tennessee territory again. But there's I'm all not, kinds of interesting stories like that. Go ahead. I'm not sure how much he worked anywhere ever again after that. It was, I think he might've gone. Was it right? Was he coming from a nice run in the Knoxville territory in the middle of 73? Or was he about to go there? I want to say he was about to go somewhere. So maybe that. I don't remember where it was, but I remember reading the interview. He was getting ready to go somewhere when all this happened. And then yeah. he, had to let, he had to let Nick know, because Nick didn't even know all this happened. And uh, I think it was that, that he went to Knoxville, had a nice run, and then maybe down to McGurk or something. And by the mid-70s, he was, he was pretty much done. His, his wife was a wrestler also, Vern Bottoms. She always thought it was an intriguing name for a girl wrestler. Yeah, Vern Gagne went into porn. <laughs> Vern Bottoms. I'm Vern Bottoms here with Wally Carbo. Uh, well, let's head straight for the bottom, shall we? And talk about this week's wrestling shows. And since we last left you, the events on television have been AEW on Wednesday night, the 28th of September, and SmackDown on September 30th. So going in chronological order, we come to Wednesday night first, where we Got to stay up late. Oh, boy. Um, what's going on now? We're with the, as Tony. Is somebody going to do a welfare check on Tony? Has he lost his mind? If you're asking me what's going on, I think I could confidently say Chris Jericho has a bigger voice in the makeup of that show than ever before. Oh, you can confidently think that. Oh, you, you can. I could say that with extreme confidence that Chris Jericho has more of a voice <laughs> in the makeup of that show than ever before. But I also think some other people do. I think Brian Danielson does maybe for the first time in AEW, really. MJF clearly does because all of his segments reek of MJF. No one else <laughs> is going to tell him what to do, I don't think. So I think the story of this week's show was Chris Jericho's brand of Monday Night Raw being on Wednesday night, and also 
I think it's now become apparent even to diehard AEW fans that the women's division is a disaster. Ooh, well, let's let's jump into it. The opening segment was the Jericho Appreciation Society in-ring promo celebration of Chris Jericho becoming the Ring of Honor World Champion. <sighs> And they all came out in purple suits. Who's got the, not only the wardrobe budget, but who makes this shit? They just said, we're all going to wear purple. And some poor seamstress somewhere has to whip all this stuff up. They don't decide that. One person decides that. Well, you know what I mean. And I mean, from the start, Cool Hand Luke imitated Roman Reigns. You know, appreciate us. So we remind everybody that we're the secondary program. We're the big stars on the other channel. And then they bring to the forefront the fucking pizza guy again. Again. But this time, instead of a 10 seconds of a pre-tape where it was embarrassing but not killing anything important, this time it... <laughs> This segment was allegedly important, and this fucking emaciated prick killed it. Uh, and by the way, did you find out, we come to find out now on the internet, the pizza-making wrestler is one of these right-wing anti-vaccine fucking lunatics, which is obviously where he's found common ground with Chris Jericho. Yeah, there was some story someone sent us, and I probably should have read it, but I didn't care enough because it's the pizza schmuck. That apparently he like fired his whole roster when they had problems with him. He was the promoter, and they're like, "Wait, we have a problem with what you're doing." He's like, "Okay, you're all fired." Yeah, they did. They didn't want to get vaccinated, or they wanted to get vaccinated, or he didn't want to get vaccinated, or they got mad at him for saying, "Ah, fuck it, you're right." Who <laughs> again? We shouldn't have to spend this much time on this, but they brought the this comedy fuck into this uh, promo where the crowd is chanting. Here's supposedly one of the top heels and his group of stooges, and the crowd's chanting, we want pizza. And then they let Anna Jay talk again. She's trying to sound like Vicky Guerrero. And finally, the whole point of this thing was Jericho comes out to, and gives Garcia, our friend Danny Garcia, a purple Gilligan hat. And he throws it down and turns <laughs> turns around and fucking punches the pizza guy and says he's had enough and he's got to get something off his chest. Now, bear in mind that for the rest of what we're about to tell you, the pizza guy took a bump from the one punch by Daniel Garcia and went down and laid there and didn't move. And nobody was checking on him. Nobody in the group was even looking at him. It was just a sight gag. So and and the the director was trying obviously to shoot around him because they didn't bother to tell the technical crew they were going to do comedy at a high level. So they're trying, but every, whenever they'd have to get a wide shot of everybody in the ring, there's this fucking nitwit still laying there, not moving a muscle. When they're talking back and forth, trying to do this angle that nobody gives a shit about anyway. So he visually killed the whole goddamn thing. And then Jericho stops Garcia from getting whatever off his chest and says, make the wrong decision. I'm going to have to take you out. Now, are you, are you a sports entertainer or a pro wrestler? This is fucking ridiculous. And the, what do they call them? The, the people who don't have sex, but it's against their will that they're not having sex. The incels, the incels in the crowd that think that this is a thing that adults would argue over. What did you say it is? People who have don't have sex, but say that again. Well, it's, 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 they're, they're not having sex, but it's against their will that they're not having sex. They'd really like to have sex if it was up to them, if oh. they could have their druthers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they're not having it because they can't. Right? That's what an incel is? I don't fucking know. But anyway, whoever's cheering for this has never heard an adult argument. So Garcia starts to answer when here comes Brian Danielson out. And I'm, I wrote, Jesus Christ, every star in this company has Garcia hanging around their neck like a fucking albatross in the old man in the sea. 
So Danielson starts talking about Garcia and says he can do whatever he wants to do. He can be a wrestler or a sports entertainer, whatever. And finally, they argued over the hat. The fake wrestler's doing comedy. Garcia's doing a long promo. The fans are cheering for silliness. And that was the first 15 minutes of this program. 15 minutes for this. And then... <laughs> Jericho's in the main event against Bandito, the household name in wrestling. He stole the ratings. <laughs> Took you a second. All right, thank you. I still have it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you still got it. It just it was a depth charge. It took. Yeah, we'll find out about that in a minute. But um, I mean, what the? F it's terrible. It's all this terrible. This was so self indulgent that. He's got a group of uninteresting fucking stooge jackoffs dressing like him, like they're all in various, you know, clockwork orange rejected costumes. And the sports entertainer versus pro wrestler thing. It, it, my God. I, I don't know. Can we move on? I just want to say a couple of things. One, I know a few people have caught on. But when they came out on the stage, it was apparent Anna J cannot stop making faces. Whenever she's on camera, watch her. She can't sit still. She's making faces the whole time. Other than that, I just want to say once again, this is the problem with Chris Jericho Unleashed. Because whatever is in his head is learned from his time in WWE. And his ideas are even worse than those. And they're all self-indulgent. They're all about building Chris Jericho and protecting Chris Jericho. And they're never good. They're the worst segments on the show, and they fit on Monday Night Raw 10 years ago. They don't fit on a progressive, happening show now. And I wish Tony Khan could put his foot down, but he won't. He's a big Chris Jericho mark. And I also wish right now there was more star power there. Because Chris Jericho's in the best position of leverage he's ever been in an AEW. That's true. They've got to... <laughs> I mean, it's down to like three names people have heard of. So, that he, you know, he's important. I just wish he'd step up and act like it instead of his goddamn, like you said, the Monday Night Raw sports entertainment reject bullshit. But after we saw these guys for 15 minutes, we go to the announcers, they billboard the show coming up, we go back to the ring, and it's Danielson against Daddy Mac. So they didn't even leave the ring. And again, Danielson's great with everything he does, but why watch this? Danielson went over. Did I miss anything? I'm going to reiterate what I said last time. I think Danielson is less creative in the ring right now than he's maybe ever been on a national stage. I don't find his matches exciting anymore. Too much of AEW is built around the cheap pop and just pleasing the people in that room, whether it makes sense or not. And I think that damages some of these matches. And again, I don't need to see guys trading fucking blows in the middle of the ring, in the middle of the match ever again. Did he do it with this job guy too? Well, I don't think he's a job guy, A. B, I think he did it. I don't even remember. But he's been doing it every match. I'm going to say it here. Because I didn't care about the match. They've made me not care about Brian Danielson. He's made me not care about himself because of just he allows all this to happen. But the booking of him has been atrocious. I don't care about the guy right now. Well... I got news for you. It's going to get worse from here. So they did a package uh, last week, MJF's business that he did, and then here comes Wheeler Useless storming to the ring. And I'm thinking, is this a rib? We're going to get more of the... What MJF is doing with Useless would be good if Useless was a star. But he's not. He looks like a guy using the internet at the library. And that's the problem here. They're doing big wrestling angles with talent that can't carry the ball or that nobody's going to give a shit about or that the only possible people that are going to care are the ones that are already there because they love everybody. But when you... It, 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 they love everybody in, in the building because they bought a ticket and left their homes and gone to see this on purpose. But the people on TV are going, what the fuck is this? So, but hey, look, 
That's not the reaction Tony wants. Tony cares about what people say on message boards, and Tony cares about what people say on Twitter. That's what he really cares about. Well, Useless goes out and calls out MJF because he's mad that MJF roughed up Shivani last week. And again, he promos like he's over. And if he just looked different and was indeed over and was a name and it anyway, here comes MJF. And that was his hometown. And this is it. He's in his hometown, Philadelphia. <clears throat> and finally, the, once MJF got to work, they were with useless a little bit better because he ripped Philly, ripped Shivani. You know, he backhandedly kind of put useless over, which you have to do because if you told the truth, then everybody just turned the TV off. And MJF finally got the shut the fuck up chant and then buried Joe Frazier and the Phillies. Have you noticed they're bleeping shit now? Finally, thankfully. Um, you'd have fired up. The last of this promo, if it was anybody but him, it would have been good, but it's still fucking Yuta. And then the ass boys come out to back MJF up, and MJF agrees to face Yuta next week in Washington, D.C. And then MJF leaves, and the guns do his catchphrase. <sighs> if they're using Yuta as just a cannon fodder to put heat on MJF, I'll work with it. But if this is a highly competitive match and it looks like that Yuta belongs with MJF in the ring, then we're all doomed. We're all doomed. What you think about the promo? I didn't like it as much as you did. And I said it a few times already. I'll say it again. Garcia and especially Yuta are Tony Khan's Eric Watts. <laughs> and especially you, because it just doesn't feel like he's ready. It doesn't feel like it's time. It felt like, all right, I'm going to go out there and do my first real big promo. I'm ready. Here I go. Like, it didn't feel natural to me at all. MJF was great. He's always great. But he needs someone to work with. Hopefully this ends at the next event and then MJF moves on to something and someone else. But you a talented guy, but they're pushing him at a point where he's not, he's not ready for this yet. At least I don't think so. And say so, now that's the th you say. Well, I like the promo better than you did. I've been watching a lot of WWF promos lately, and Yuta, the promo he did because of just the fact that he had some emotion and wasn't just reciting scripted verbiage, would have probably been in the upper ten percentile of WWF promos these days. Now grading on an overall historical curve it still sucked but <laughs> nevertheless um so then they had a match that was very interesting did i hear this correct brian they have the match juice robinson versus john moxley and if juice robinson wins then he gets john moxley next week for the title yes what they call it a championship challenger match or something whatever the fuck has Juice Robinson ever wrestled on this program before? Before I say no, I know you and I saw him somewhere once, and I can't imagine where else it would have been, so possibly once. So this guy just wanders in out of nowhere and gets a match against the world champion, where if he beats the world champion, then he gets another match the next week against the world champion for the world title. Because Juice Robinson is supposed to be somebody in Japan, right? Again, I, I, I haven't seen too much of him. I've heard good things about him, but he is a foreign star for New Japan Pro Wrestling. What I'm saying is that's the only reason why that Tony Khan or anybody else would give this guy a match against the world champion competitively in his first appearance on television, or the first one we can recall, is because he's supposed to be a big deal in Japan. Nobody knows who the fuck he is. He looked like Adam Page cosplaying as a Hell's Angel when he came to the ring. But again, this was an indie match. And even before they'd established who Juice Robinson is or what the fuck's going on, Robinson jumps Moxley on the floor before the bell. <laughs> fights him on the floor, then rolls him into the ring, the bell rings start the match, and then all the action stops. And then Moxley goes back out to the floor, 
and starts beating old Juice Boy up on the floor and throws him over a table. It was every bad indie match ever again. They took the turns with the shitty forearms. Juice Robinson's look really bad. Then they worked some spots in quicksand. Then they went back to the floor and went to the break. When they came back from the break, Moxley was bleeding. Imagine that. He must have had a pap smear during the break. They were still fighting on the floor when they came back from the break. I assume they just never left. Moxley did a dive, more indie shit. Juice Robinson hits Christian's old unprettier finish for a two count. Then Juice goes for some kind of move, but fucked it up and fell on his ass, I guess. And Moxley stomped him and got Anoki's arm breaker and tapped him out. A rotten match with an abrupt finish featuring a guy that the average person at home has no fucking clue who he is or where he came from. And it's sad because he showed personality. You know, if he was built up over a few weeks, someone would care about him getting a title match beyond whoever watches him already in New Japan. I don't know. I saw his work. I'm not sure after a couple he, weeks anybody would. He's in there with Moxley. Moxley works one match. The Moxley match. I, I didn't see anything earth-shaking about Juice Robinson. Let's put it that way. Maybe... Well, he has a fun name. Juice. Maybe they should team him up with Pockets. Juice and Juice? Yeah. The Juicy Express? The Juicy Express. Did I miss any greatness <laughs> in this contest? No, of course you All didn't. Right. You didn't miss any greatness on this okay. episode in Philadelphia. Poor Philadelphia. Okay, so poor Philadelphia. Why did they get so put upon like this so so moxley wins right here comes the music and here comes hangnail adam page the ring and he has a face off with moxley and again you've got two baby faces tony always backs himself in this corner where he has no choice but to have two baby faces standing there staring at each other over his world title but at least this time he has an instigator mjf was up in the the uh, skybox, and he's going to cash his chip in in Cincinnati. Apparently, Paige and Moxley are going to fight each other in Moxley's hometown. And then MJF plans to cash in. But Yuta shows up behind MJF in the skybox, and they have a big fight with security. And that's what that's I guess mainly where I was saying if they were doing all this stuff they're doing with Yuta with a star, this would be great shit. Can you I can see Ricky Starks. Well, but I'm just saying the 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 skybox fight and up there that had elements of Steve Austin and the rock in the attitude era. It's not the angle that's bad, it's the subpar talent that they put into them. Ricky Starks. So, Ricky Starks and MJF would be good. But it, anything would be better than you. To, although I don't fucking know, actually. We'll get to Starks in a minute. I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, then... <laughs> here comes Soraya. You know, I'm thinking... I get Obviously, WWE trademarked her name, but I'm thinking, what would they have done if WWE hadn't trademarked their name? Would they have had yet another page? Adam Page, uh, fucking, what's his name? Ethan Enid, Page. Enid? Not Enid, Enid Page. Enid Page, really? Enoch Page. There's a name you don't hear anymore. And then Page Page. I mean, you know, so she starts the promo. I'm back. Okay, welcome back, welcome back from the crowd. I will create change in this division. And the crowd chants, this is your house. This is your house. And then she says she's nervous. I thought it was Swerve's house. Well, it's anybody's house that happens to be standing there. That's why everybody's got the keys. And uh, so she's rusty, but here's the thing. Can Paige talk? We, I've seen very little Paige. And uh, obviously, the last time that she was in the in the business, it's been three or four years, right? I don't know that we were watching the programming on a regular basis at that point. So the point is, if she's not rusty, if she's not nervous, 
Can Page do a good promo? Do you remember? I remember her being pretty good in the ring when she wrestled. But I was never a fan of her on the mic. Now, to be fair, other people did like her on the mic. Other people really got into her as the GM. Other people were really into the way WWE has booked and used some of these women. I personally thought good in the ring. I was never a big fan of her on the mic. Well, in that case, she ain't going to get any better than this, I guess. But somebody off camera, <laughs> I guess some production assistant, floor director, was rushing her to bring the women out because she then said, well, don't wrap me up. I'll go as long as I want. Oh, I guess let's bring the women out. Here they come. And out came Tony Storm, Athena, Sky Blue, Willow Nightingale, and someone else that I missed the name. And they were all put together by Stokely Hathaway, and they're calling themselves The Firm. Just a random <laughs> bunch of people put together to walk out. What was that? Well, and I'm like, is this the whole division? You know, except for Britt Baker's group. Where's Ruby Soho? I thought of her. Um, but anyway, Soraya starts talking to Tony Storm, but then here comes Britt Baker and Reba and Jamie Hayter. And I'm thinking that Soraya was supposed to introduce all these girls one at a time because she said, let me introduce them one at a time. So that was a clue. But then she got to Tony Storm, and before they even went anywhere else, here comes the heels, because this has already gone a while, and other things on this program have apparently taken forever. So Soraya says Brit's name rhymes with shit, but they bleeped that one too. This badly illustrated why there needs to be an announcer or a show host or some authority figure running the interviews and moving things along, expediting the process. Uh, you know, when you've got green talent that's not used to doing television, and or you've got uh, some of these talents may not be green, but you can't say that they've ever worked under any administration where they would have done television strictly and by the book and keeping an eye on times and things like that. Uh, Britt Baker wouldn't have done that. Uh, Hater wouldn't have done it. I get uh, Athena and Storm have been to the WWF, but nevertheless, there needs to be somebody running these interviews to keep this thing moving along and remind people of what they forgot and fucking re engage people when they start wandering. Because when they let the talent go out there and just do their own shit, it's like the South Park wrestling episode where they, they think they're emoting and everybody else is rolling their fucking eyes. So Britt Baker brings Serena out, and somehow they set up a lumberjack match for the interim women's title between Storm and Serena, and it didn't sound like a lot of people were thrilled at that. And then they had the match, which Tony Storm won, and Brian, from the top of the promo to the bottom of the match, this was 22 minutes on national television devoted to what I just talked about in 90 seconds. This was one of the worst segments, again, going from the beginning to the end, in the history of AEW. It was horrible. Those fans in Philadelphia reacted to the women's division the way everyone else is. People are popping for Paige or Soraya because they're happy to see her. Let's see where this goes. Once again, she didn't touch anyone. I don't even think she took a physical. Everyone says she wasn't cleared. Did she even take a physical? That's Has what somebody like taken her temperature? We will find out, but the promo Somebody was horrible. Somebody said that, that, that she and, and Xavier Woods and at Brad Maddox are going to be the next trios champion. Will you so stop it? To be able to, well, that's what somebody said on Twitter. Nobody said. Will you behave yourself? Somebody did say that. Who said that? Somebody on Twitter. Of course. Well, what I was going to say is... I get their goddamn driver's license. I just saw something the other day. I hate to bring this up, but now you made me think of it. Someone sent me something the other day. Hey, did you see this? And I looked at it. I said, I don't know what this is. And then they spelled it out. There was a picture of Brad Maddox with some woman, and she was talking about, apparently his wife is a marriage counselor who talks about being married to her husband for like 15 years. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was filmed, whatever. Funny well, things no, going no, that, on. That's, that's a gimmick. That's a gimmick also because he can't have been married for 15 years. He, he's only like fucking in his early 30s to begin with. He was at OVW 10 years ago. 
as I recall, I believe I saw him. Well, anyway, you, um, you've but no, it, he's that. he's some kind of he's it's like you know the B roll shots they get. <laughs> there's there's a guy and his girlfriend walking down the beach. He's just doing. He's an actor playing that part apparently, in in advertising or whatever. I saw the previous part he played, and I don't need to see any more. I guess the point is, let's yeah. go back to what we were talking about here. I don't know why you decided to go down this road, but well, the promo was horrible. Yeah, it the was. only person here that was truly over again, Sarai is getting a reaction right now because people are happy to see her. Jamie Hader, we've been saying it for a while. The people have caught up. Jamie Hader, she's still being held back. They had a few moments where they could have turned her on Brit. They've waited. Now the moment's here. They got to do something sooner rather than later. But the whole division's a mess. Jamie Hader's really good. Who's she supposed to wrestle? Who? Thunder Rosa when she comes back? Serena Deeb? The fans have not really reacted well to Serena Deeb. All the other women who just bounced out we've never really seen on TV before? Right? What was that? It was like, here's... A woman you know and, and other people just bouncing out to the ring. <laughs> Show us the women on the roster. We've seen the women's roster. Where was Jade? Where were the ones who were presented as stars? They weren't out there for this segment. I know a lot of people hate to hear this, but the women's division in AEW should be a separate spin-off show slash brand, and they should focus on just one thing. It kills the show. It kills the ratings usually for the segments. The fans sit there in silence. It's not productive to the wrestling company. It's more just making everyone else feel better because there's an equal, or not even equal, they're to be given an equal portion of the show. There's a portion of the show assigned to the less popular form of wrestling. It doesn't make much sense, and it's killing the show. Uh, I got to disagree. I got high hopes for Willow Nightingale. All right. Who uh, knows? We, we haven't really seen her. I mean, she, who knows? Maybe she is good. No, no, she, none of, no. Well, they haters good. Haters good. I'm I'm playing. Haters all right. I don't hate hater. I'll tell you what I do hate. Tony Schiavone being the in the back again with the interchangeable, underneath talent that never get a chance to do anything except argue with each other while Tony's in the middle of them. Private Party and Butcher and Baker and Andre Olio Leo and Jose. And everybody's arguing, and nobody cares or understands what they're fucking saying. And then Matt Hardy comes in and tells Private Party he understands and things were he did bad things in the past, but he'll be waiting when the storm ends for them. To come. <laughs> Jesus Christ! So now Matt, big money Matt Hardy, crooked Matt Hardy. I cheated these guys when I signed them to a contract. Matt Hardy is now a baby face and wants to make amends. Do these people ever wrestle? I'm not advocating for them to wrestle on this program. We got to watch, but they just stand in the back and argue with each other because Tony is too nice to just say, I don't need you people anymore. Other than his ability to make people turn off the TV, what is Matt Hardy adding to anything in AEW right now? Didn't you not groan when all of a sudden he's out there with a private party again? <laughs> we have to relive this? <laughs> this? Long-term storytelling. They've been telling this story for three years. We still don't understand it. All right. You mentioned Ricky Starks earlier. And we've been high on Ricky Starks and a fan of Ricky Starks. And then all of a sudden, Hobbs turned on him for very little reason, but he's okay. We want to see both these guys used. We love Hobbs. We love Starks. Then they have a pay-per-view match that lasted like six minutes, and the end came out of nowhere, and it just bleh, and we're like, did somebody get hurt? What happened? Then they have the rematch, which turns out to be a garbage match that you're doing with a guy that broke his neck in your ring, what, last year, Starks. And they have a garbage match where it's like you can't really tell what the fuck, where they're at, what they can do. And now here's Starks against a job guy in a one-minute win on television. Again, the ass-backwards booking of Tony Khan. Let's start people doing jobs in long main event matches. And then after they've been on TV for two years, let's put them in one-minute squashes. But this was a one-minute win for Starks, and somehow they fucked that up. I mean, literally, it was a fucking headlock and a couple of punches in the corner, a shoot-off spot, and 
Starks went up and over, hit the ropes, came ready for the, hit the guy with a spear, and the other guy seemed ready to take it, and they ran right past each other. And then as they ran past each other, both of them sold it like, where the fuck the other guy go? Did you see that? Yep. And then Starks just keeps on running, hits the ropes, and comes off the other side and hits him with a spear, and then it's his finish, one, two, three. They were running full steam at each other and missed each other. How the fuck does that even happen? Who was on what page? I don't... Another page? Another page. So that was Ricky Starks' one-minute win. Anyway, at that point, here came the Ring of Honor World Championship. And not only, I mean, there's been several generations of fans that had fond memories of Ring of Honor. There was the ones that loved it when it was just the, you know, little bitty tiny indie wrestlers doing flipping and scramble matches that it started out and then it grew up a little bit and it was the best indie workers and unsigned guys in the business having hard hitting matches. And then some people liked it when the fucking Cucamonga kids and the cosplayers took over and held the company hostage. And, but it, has Chris Jericho in the manner in which that he currently conducts himself and or works in the ring would this Chris Jericho ever have fit since 2002 as the Ring of Honor World Champion? This version of Chris Jericho? Yes. Probably not. And I saw somebody say, oh, but it's brilliant that they did it because of Jericho's name value to get the Ring of Honor World title over. Oh, Jesus Christ. I agree, put the title on a star so that it will be over. But do you put, who's your favorite baseball player right now? Brian? Uh, my favorite regular player or pitcher? Yeah, fe just figure, regular, regular, regular favorite baseball player. Who plays baseball right now you like? I really like Pete Alonzo, but that's a popular pick. Okay, should Pete Alonzo be the next winner of American Idol? Oh, God, no. No, no, no. He shouldn't even be in it, in the competition. Okay. okay, then just because people know who Chris Jericho is doesn't mean he's a choice for Ring of Honor World Champion. He's been the AEW champion. They've established that the AEW title is not the same genre as the Ring of Honor title. Ring of Honor title was always about the young, the hard-hitting, the technical in-ring, fucking kids that could go. And this is just, he's, as a heel, he's trying to get a heat with the Ring of Honor fans by destroying its legacy and tearing it all down and all that stuff. But what he's doing is he's just making people roll their eyes. At, at Ring of Honor, a Ring of, now Jericho's got a, a title belt from another promotion that doesn't even exist and is not on television, and so he can show it on AEW television. This whole thing is sideways. It's not going to please the Ring of Honor fans that existed, such as those that may be left. And as for the AEW fans, it's another goddamn belt. Everybody in this company has one already. Some people have more than one. So Jericho puts the Ring of Honor title on the line against Bandido, the former Ring of Honor champion who... From what I have heard and understood, they went insane and signed full-time for a ridiculous amount of money for Sinclair Broadcasting and Ring of Honor's, you know, levels. And, again, Ring of Honor, after the Cucamonga kids left, was taken over by the Lucha guys, and they were trying to go for in-ring action without concentrating on it was the in-ring work that got Ring of Honor over. Not just mindless flipping action, but the work of the guys that took it seriously. So you got Chris Jericho, 50 years old, against a fucking 
Masked Lucha Guy, my two favorite things. So I skipped ahead to the finish, and guess what? Jericho tapped him out with the walls of Jericho in what I'm sure was a scintillating performance by both men. Did I miss anything, Brian? No, no not really. Bandito got offered a AEW contract after this, apparently. Oh, I'm, sh I'm sure he did. You get those like you get cars when you go to Oprah Winfrey's TV tapings, don't you? Just everybody gets one. What? How is... I mean, we used to call it a clash of styles, but how is Chris Jericho versus Bandito? How is that a marquee main event match that you would put on national television in the United States of America between uh, 9.40 and 10 p.m.? And expect anybody to watch it. You don't. I mean, you're only fooling yourself if you think that, and I can't imagine they're that dumb. You knew people were going to tune out because it's Bandito, and as good as he may be, no one knows who he is. It's just another guy out there with a weird mask against Jericho, who is one of the biggest stars they have right now, but still, he's not pulling people in if he's doing something no one cares about. And if anyone wants a good reason to be mad at CM Punk, or mad at Omega and the Bucks, this is it. There you go. This is what we're left with now. <laughs> Chris Jericho running that TV show, and it's horrible. And there's uh -huh. no one who has worked as hard as Chris Jericho to get to this position next to Tony Khan. And he is relishing this. But the program is horrible. His stuff is all sorts of bad. And we'll see where this goes in the weeks ahead. But they need some star power quick. And they need someone else who's going to help out with these segments so it's not raw reject segments. He just uh, uh, promoted 16 people to various positions in talent relations just purely to talk to these people and find out if they're grumpy or not instead of, hey, let's book some good shit and lay some good matches out and teach some guys some things. AEW is not good right now. It's really not good right now. There's a few things that are good. There are a few people that are good. There are other people that... You think are good, but they're never on TV. But the TV is rotten. The booking's horrible. Some of the stuff is so lame, you don't even know how it got on the air. Nothing seems coherent. It's just a complete fucking So in other right words, bu business as usual. A lot of people are going to say, oh, well, he doesn't have his VPs and he doesn't have pub, but <laughs> explain the previous three years. Anyway, speaking of explaining things, you got some explaining to do. We just talked about this television program. My thought would be that a lot of people started watching it because they hung around from the Big Bang and they lost a ton of people again. And from what I hear, I'm correct in that assumption. Do you have the, the statistics available? And again, I know the Big Bang started the galaxy, but I'm not sure if the Big Bang Theory is holding up the way it used to in terms of ratings, but I do have some information here. Would it be something if AEW killed the Big Bang Theory's ratings? That would say something if about they civilization. Said, well, we don't want to watch the Big Bang Theory. We're afraid that we might accidentally run over into AEW and see that accidentally. The average for this week's rating was 990,000 viewers, down off 1,039,000 a week earlier and 1,175,000 two weeks before that. But bigger part of the story is where they start and where they finish because. A couple of weeks ago, they actually had a main event and kept the audience from start to finish, right? Yes, they did. Because it was Danielson and Moxley, was it? Or wait, wait, who it was, was Jericho it? and Moxley. Jericho and Moxley. So that's a main event. We know that's who right. they are. And we know and that people will tune in to see Moxley. That would, Despite what we say about him, we know that people tune in to see him. Unfortunately, I don't know what the fucking appeal is, but yes, they do. So they gave them a main event. They kept their audience. This week, they didn't give them a main event. And in the middle between the first and the last was fucking rotten. So where did those numbers start and where did they finish? Yeah, and again, too, you need a good commentating team to hold viewers. And I think that's still something that hasn't been addressed and it won't be addressed. But Taz is the only one out there I would have out there. Excalibur is way too much at this point, and Shivani doesn't say a goddamn thing the whole night. It's all, well, you're right, or I'm really digging this, it's great to be here, or wow, it's amazing. Nothing. He has no insight. You know what? You to gotta say. do it again. You gotta have one of the Arcadian Vanguard minions 
just transcribe everything that Tony Schiavone says during the course of a match. I thought about it during two different matches this week. I don't remember the matches. I'm like, oh, I wish I was transcribing this. Oh, I wish this was transcribed. <laughs> it's every match, though. He says nothing. He's literally useless on commentary. He adds nothing. You want to use Shivani? You like him? He's kind of like your company mascot? Use him as the interviewer. Don't put him on commentary. You're just putting a third guy in the booth for no reason because he doesn't say anything. And that makes the problems with Excalibur worse. And I know a lot of people like Excalibur, but no, you're all wrong. Let me go back <laughs> to the ratings here. Quarter by quarter breakdown. Quarter one, and I believe this is from WrestleNomics. Let's give credit where it's due. Quarter one, Jericho Appreciation Society segment. 1,208,000 viewers. For the record, 559,000 in the 18 to 49 demo. Quarter two, Danielson versus Matt Menard, as well as a build up video for Juice Robinson versus Moxley. 1,016,000 viewers, down 192,000 off the opening segment. Segment three, MJF, or quarter three, I guess, technically. MJF and Wheeler Uter's dual promo and a few of the other promos, 962,000 viewers, uh. down another 54,000. The final quarter of hour one, Moxley versus Juice Robinson with the post match with Adam Page and the brawl with MJF and Uta, back up 1,013,000, 51,000 up from the previous segment. So now we're going into hour two, the nine o'clock hour, quarter five. The MJF and Yuta fight, a Bandito video, and Soraya's promo, 997,000 viewers, down 16,000. Quarter six, Tony Storm versus Serena Deeb with the acclaimed and Keith Lee segment, 975,000 viewers, down an additional 22,000. Quarter seven, various interviews, it says here. I believe the Matt Hardy uh, private party one was one of them. Plus, Ricky Starks versus Eli Osom, or Isom, whatever his name is here, 875,000 viewers, down an additional 100,000. Yeah, and by, and by the way, that was after the girls segment. That's right. And quarter eight, the main event for the Ring of Honor World Heavyweight Championship, Chris Jericho versus Bandito, 879,000 viewers, plus 371,000 in the 18 to 49 key demo. So that's down off the 549 to start. So basically, uh, 320-something thousand people from start to finish decided, fuck it. And they left. What is a good hemorrhage rate for viewers? I, I, yeah. My God, I don't think there is a good one, is there? Don't you want more people watching the end than... I mean, that's the way it used to be with a wrestling program. All wrestling programs, more people watched the main event or the last part of the show than watched any other part of the program. That's why Sting and Flair on the first Clash of Champions, what was that? It was a two and a half hour program. Their quarter did like, what, a 7.8? All of the shows, even in the Attitude Era, I can't remember losing hundreds of thousands of viewers from start to finish maybe it happened every once in a while and i mean there were the the numbers were a lot bigger so what am i thinking about they back in those days they varied a couple of hundred thousand viewers from quarter to quarter just because the numbers were so much bigger overall but i don't remember any program that WCW ever did or WWF ever did in the Attitude Era or in the 80s or really any time losing 30, 35% of its audience over the course of it from start to finish. That's that's a new phenomenon, isn't it? I would think so, but let me play devil's advocate with you. There was a hurricane happening. Do you think that is stand a... Stand back! Stand back. There's a hurricane coming through. What about that as something that would affect the viewership? And even with that said, what does that say about the drop-off from segment one to segment eight? Well, no, uh, I don't think the hurricane would have affected the viewership on an ongoing basis. People already knew the hurricane was happening. It wasn't like suddenly after an hour and a half of AEW, oh, geez, we got to check the hurricane now and 100,000 people go away. 
the the pattern was the same as it's been more often than not on this program, especially recently. Put, you know, Twinkle Toes in his debut or his return match back in the main event, loses two or three hundred thousand, put the six man bullshit or the cosplaying wrestlers at the, you know, in the main event segment, lose 300,000 viewers. This is the same thing it's been to. I don't think the hurricane, I mean, it's again, it wasn't like that anybody, but the people in Florida, it wasn't like it was crucial that anybody find out at that point, what's going on with the hurricane, except the people it was affecting. And you know what? Most of those people probably didn't have any fucking electricity. They were watching anyway. So, no, I don't think they can blame the hurricane. To talk about a bit of the bigger picture here, people are now starting to notice some of the problems a little more, even though we've been talking about it for a while, but because it's now affecting things that are visible, like ticket sales and ratings, people are starting to talk about it more, notice it a little more. Word has gotten out, I believe even Dave Meltzer in The Observer, talking about it now, AEW ticket sales have become a problem. They're not selling anymore. Well, <sighs> or as much or as fast as they once were. Yeah, I mean, it's not like everybody's just saying, oh, geez, take these back. We want our money back. But no, they're, they're going back to towns that used to be an automatic sellout or a great first day, and they're doing, you know, minor percentages of what they did the last time they were in the town. If anybody had treated this like a normal business, they then that wouldn't be surprising. But because they've been you know, uh, blinded by the light, uh, they they thought that AEW was somehow impervious or invulnerable to this. It happens after the first time in a market, you know, is a big deal, especially now. Back in the old days, yes, you could build your town. When you opened up a, a new market for live events, that means you'd been on TV for maybe 12 weeks in that town, and then you start running your live events, and you build the crowd as more people find out about it, as more people know wrestling is back in that town, or more people know that the wrestling TV show is on the air, whatever, you build your crowd. Classic example, Lexington, Kentucky, I was there to see it. First show after 12 weeks of TV did 1,500 people. Second show dropped down to about 1,300 because it wasn't a brand new first one. But then the third one, because the word of mouth started getting around 2,600. Then they did over 4,000 people. Six months in, they're doing 5,000 people a show. But with AEW, all that's been reversed. Everybody, every wrestling fan knew this was going to happen. The internet and the buzz and the talk and the advanced publicity and the anticipation. Everybody knew it was going to happen. Still to this day, the first episode of AEW television was the highest rated one. Because everybody wanted to see, you know, everybody, everybody for the purpose of this exercise, right? The, the, the everybody number is shrinking as we go year by year, but everybody wants to see what it was going to look like. And then they did. And then the diehards that are going to accept it no matter what have stuck with it. And I believe that honestly is the number of people that watch the Rampage show on Friday, plus maybe a few extra ones that just might not be able to stay up that late or have shit to do on Friday nights. And the fluctuation of the difference between 750 or 800,000 and 1.2 million is the people who will tune in either because they're already there and they'll give it a chance for a little while to see what's going on, or they tuned in specifically to see how the all out fallout was going to be handled, the media scrum, or the big hot shot mega card they've promoted, or some wink wink surprise or debut that's their ceiling 1.2 and that's their seller is about 750 800 and there's been no there's been no uh movement in that since the start so you asked about the ticket sales it's going to happen it's not new anymore 
It's not new that this other company besides the evil empire once run by Vince McMahon is going to run this big building in my town. They've been here two or three times now. So maybe I can, I can start picking and choosing because didn't we say that the first pay-per-view all in, I said it was the world's largest history's largest crowdfunding experiment. There were so many people mad at Vince McMahon and the WWE and that company and the way they'd treated their favorite wrestlers that they wanted to will into existence an opponent, an alternative, a, a competitor. And those people that were really devoted to see that were willing to put their money where their mouth was. Remember, they sold out instantly and everybody, oh my God, this has never happened before. That's because it wasn't just the people in Chicago. It was the people from all over the country that were willing to fly there or to get on a bus or drive or to take a pilgrimage, whatever. And then for the first pay-per-views, it was the same thing. It was a status symbol. Get the ticket. We'll get there no matter where we got to come from or how hard we have to try. And I said at the time, three years ago, I said, that's it's great that they have this devoted fan base that wants to spend any amount of money to get there and to support them. Even if they buy a ticket and they can't show up, they'll still do it because it's it was crowdfunding. It was a GoFundMe for a do-it-yourself wrestling promotion run by the boys. And then Tony Khan steps in, and one of the reasons why he made these knuckleheads EVPs is because he wanted to keep the the crowdfunding aspect that we're in this together that this is the company that's going to be nice to the wrestlers and this is the company that's not going to fuck around your favorites that was part of the strategy I would say more about that except my NDA might fucking prevent me can I say something? sure the crowdfunding thing mentally ends once Tony Khan is in the picture. People understand the money that's in the picture. And, you know, a lot of people made comments about millionaires and billionaires trying to do things before it happened. Go back and check that out. But the people were invested in Cody Rhodes. The people were invested in the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. I mean, those were the big guys when AEW first started. People wanted to see what Jericho was going to do. People were ready to see what Moxley was going to do. And now look at where we are. Tony Khan wasn't on that list, by the way, because people didn't know what he sounded like. People didn't know what he really looked like yet. Right. Now, now the only, the, the only, I'll oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, now Cody's gone and we ha will never be told publicly, or at least it'll be a long time what really went down, but there was a lot of shit that went down. The Young Bucks and Omega are currently gone. According to the Observer, they haven't even heard from anyone in AEW in weeks. We'll see what happens there if and when they come back. Jericho's still there. Moxley's still doing their thing. But now Tony's front and center. And now instead of thinking, this is my company with my wrestlers, you know whose company it is. You know whose project it is. It's all about Tony for good and for bad. And now that people know that, they look at it differently than they did when it first started up with Omega, the Bucks, and Cody as the faces of the company. One thing I'll disagree with you on, you said, well, the crowdfunding aspect ended when Tony got involved. No, it didn't. They still were flying to every pay-per-view and snatching up those tickets at the start, but then slowly, a yes, people have started to realize, wait a minute, this fucking company, the alternative to the company funded by the billionaire that we hate, this company's funded by a billionaire, ultimately with more money than the billionaire we hated, Tony Khan's father, because Vince don't have the money Shad's got. So... My statement, and we can go back, and its I'm sure it's on the YouTube channel, official Jim Cornette, or wherever it lives. Um, I said, how long can this last? How long, how much money, and for how long can the diehards get a, a ticket for every pay-per-view and fly to every big event and every all-out and all-in and this and that? That's starting to wear off because... At, at some point with anything that is plentiful, you know, when you, when you first get something that you really like and there's not much of it and you've been starved for a while and boy, here, you're going to make every effort to get that thing. 
but then it's plentiful and it's available and it's ongoing and you're running lower on money and you got other things going on. That's where you have to use that fan base that you start with to subsist on while you make a bigger fan base, while you expose yourself to a bigger audience, while you try to attract somebody else into the tent. And at least TV viewers, and you would think they'd be easier to get than live event ticket purchasing patrons, nobody else is walking into this tent. It's the same group. And it's about 30% of the group that the WWF has, WWE has, which is about, what, a fifth or a sixth of the group that they used to have. So we're fighting for a smaller piece of the pie, but that's that's the point I'm mentioning. I asked three or four years ago, I'm saying it now, I believe we're seeing the signs, how long are these people going to be able to fund this thing just to get even with the billionaire now that the billionaire is already out of the picture and forced into retirement? And the heat's off the WWE with a lot of fans because it's a new day with a new guy in charge and somebody that gave them the style of, of wrestling that they wanted NXT for a number of years and has built up some goodwill with them. And now they're willing to give him a chance. Meanwhile, Tony Khan and those big pop eyes of his is the one instead of being the alternative to the evil billionaire is now the one that's running the company that regardless, like you said, of which side of the fence you're on, they're either mad at him because he fucked CM Punk around or they mad at, they're mad they mad at him because he fucked around Twinkle Toes and the Hardly Boys. And now instead of the lavish praise that he gets for bringing Shangri-La to wrestling, Tony pops his head out in his buildings now and he gets booed for that very reason. So I think that's that's the worm that's turning that we're seeing right now. And they've had three years to make a, a, a broader audience, not run off their original fans, but compliment them. And because he's constantly Mark booked this thing, it, 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 he can't get anybody except the really devoted Marks that are not fans, they're Marks, and they think like Marks, and he's booking like a Mark. And that's what you get. You get, anytime you let the Marks have a piece of paper and a pencil and the ability to write down wrestlers' names, you get the fattest guy against the other fattest guy, or the tallest guy against the other tallest guy, or fucking 18 people against each other at the same time, and everybody has a goddamn... Bowie knife and fucking spurs on or some ridiculous bullshit that most people are going to go, what the fuck is going on here? This makes no sense because they're all looking at wrestling like it's not supposed to make sense. It's just supposed to be a fucking video game of a car wreck. And that's where he's lost all the other people that he's had three years to fucking get. But you know what that program did for me, Brian? No. It killed my appetite. Oh, no. Killed. I went to bed without my supper, thanks to that program. But fortunately, I woke up hungry the next day. Because that's a funny thing. You eat one day, you wake up the next day, you're hungry again. It just never ends. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I usually get hungry every day. Yeah, it, it's like my ungrateful wife, Stacy. We've been married well, don't now. Don't say that. No, we've don't been married. Say that we've at been all. married for almost 15 years. I'll have you know our anniversary is October 31st is Halloween, and she's so ungrateful. Ever since we've been married, I've supported her. I put food on her table. I feed her every day, and the next day she turns around and wants to eat again. Nothing about yesterday. Thank you for feeding me yesterday. It's just what are we going to eat today? It never ends. But I'll tell you what, folks. Now we can bring that to an end. You won't want to eat any more after we tell you about this remarkable new sponsor because you'll be fixed up for eating. No more will you have to wonder what you're going to eat, where it's going to come from. You might have to wonder how you're going to pay for it. We can't help you there. But the folks at Factor have ready-to-eat meals that are delivered to your door, whether you need a click, quick, a click lunch, a quick lunch, a quick or a nutritious dinner, <laughs> or a kick lunch, or the lunch that will kick you, or kick lunch, kick the habit, don't have lunch. 
whatever you want, lunches, meals, nutritiousness, they're ready in minutes. Factor makes it easy and it's cheaper than these food delivery programs where they charge you money to bring the food to you and also they'll dip into your bag and take your fries and etc. We've seen this happen many times. The folks at Factor, they're fresh, never frozen meals. They're delivered ready to heat and eat in two minutes. And these things, they're not only never frozen, they're impossible to freeze. Put them in the freezer, they won't freeze. As a matter of fact, at winter time, you can take these meals and pour them under the tires of your car. It provides excellent traction in that, snowy weather. That is not what you should do with these meals, and that's not anything anyone should consider. You should consider eating these delicious meals when they arrive, and they arrive fresh. Yes, and never frozen. You can't freeze these things. They offer 30-plus meals a week and 36-plus add-on options. Smoothies, juices, and snacks, and stuff like that. I'll tell you what, you're going to weigh 5,000 pounds if you eat all these meals. 30 meals a week, plus 36 add-on options. Thankfully, they are committed to ingredients with integrity, and you can feel good about what you're eating here at Factor because the nutritionists... That, well, they've come up with all this. They've got a plan. They've got offerings like Protein Plus. As a matter of fact, the Protein Plus preference that you can pick, see the alliteration there, makes it easy to power up with deliciously satisfying meals with 30 grams of proteins or more. How, how much is 30 grams in pounds? Oh, I don't know. I don't know the conversion. I think most of these dinners have like between three and four pounds of protein in each one. No, I wouldn't say that, and I wouldn't promise that, but they certainly have a lot of protein if you choose one of the dishes with protein. Yes, protein plus. They got keto options. That's what Stace is doing right now. She's They had chili, and they had That's all protein. kinds of... That, that has protein in it. That's But it's keto also. See, sometimes you can cross over. You can have your keto and eat your protein, too. But Protein Plus, keto meals, calorie smart meals, if you're trying to cut down on the calories, boy, these calorie smart meals, they're practically empty. You're eating air. Plus vegan and veggie options. Or is it vegan and veggie? We, need, we didn't vegan get that straight veggie. last week. No, we got it straight. It's vegan and veggie. Well, that's what you say. And not only do factor meals save time, but they also keep you satisfied, folks. I don't know about sexually, but certainly... Uh, calorically, and, and it'll make your tummy feel good. The chef-crafted recipes are packed with restaurant-quality flavor. But it's been booted out of the restaurant, and now it's in the dish that's delivered to your door. And more free time instead of spreading, spending precious hours hustling around the store trying to get the ingredients, shoplifting all that stuff, trying to get it up under your, your petticoat or in the crotch of your jeans, and then bring it home to make the meals in your kitchen, where you can eliminate all that, the meal making, the cooking, the shoplifting, everything, and the cleanup time, if some of you actually clean up after your meals. You don't have to do any of that with Factor. You just eat the thing, and then throw the, uh, the container away. They got everything you need. Again, right now, and you'll need a pen and paper, folks, because we're going to give you some very Difficult to understand information. To figure in on factor, to get these ready to meet, ready to meet, ready to eat meals, or you can meet the meals if you want to. You can be introduced to them anytime they come to your home. As a matter of fact, the UPS gal will probably say, Hi, Joe, meet broccoli, things like that. You'll be introduced to them. Head right now to go, G O dot factor. F-A-C-T-O-R 75.com slash J-C-E-130 and use the code J-C-E-130 to get $130 off. Wow. Six boxes of Factor. That's the important part. You get $130 off. The other stuff, so well, you got to write down numerous letters and numerals. I Head to go.factor75.com slash jce130 use the code jce130 to get $130 off across six boxes of factor with all these delicious meals no matter what style you're eating again keto friendly calorie smart the vegan and the veggie the vegan protein veggie. plus yes 
They've even got they've they've got meals if if you like Dalmatian. They've got something for everybody. No, they don't. They do not have all we're so close to the end. Everything's going well relatively, and then you pull this out. Dalmatian. Well, I, like, I like Dalmatians. They're cute puppies, but they got some at factor for everybody. Depends on what country you're ordering from. Sometimes the standards are a little more lax than others. But right now, folks, head to go.factor75.com slash JCE130 and use the code JCE130 to get $130 off across six boxes of delicious Factor food. Factor it in to your daily schedule. Don't forget, it's delicious. It's delicious, and it's it's easy, and it's cheaper than Uber Eats and Takeout and all those type of things. Stuff yourself. That's right. Factor. What's that website? One more time, Jim. Oh, For everyone out God. there with their pen and paper. Go.factor75.com slash JCE130. Use the code JCE130. All right. Oh, well, what are what's going on in the world of wrestling that we haven't talked about on this program? I guess I we got to stay up with the wrestling news. What's going on over there? Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, and of course with the wrestling news available wherever you find your favorite podcast, including Amazon. You just ask Alexa, play the Wrestling News podcast, and it'll pop right up. But wherever you find your favorite podcast, or at the you know, wrestling Alexa news, doesn't do a lot of the things that I ask her to do. What do you ask her to do? Well, I can't really talk about that right now, but she won't do most of them. Well, after the police raid, you'll find out more about that on The Wrestling News, wherever you find your favorite podcast, of course, thewrestlingnews.com. Every day, a free daily morning wrestling newscast. No opinion, no conjecture, no bias. Just giving you straight wrestling news. No clickbait, no paywall, just The Wrestling News. Check it out each and every day and subscribe today. And of course... Videos of the Wrestling News, available on the Arcadian Vanguard video channel on YouTube. Once again, thewrestlingnews.com, or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Want to make mention of this week on Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam. It is a deep dive look at 1982 Georgia. Roddy Piper, Ric Flair, Ole Anderson, Jerry Lawler, and so much more. Hear it at mcadampod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! I'm pretty sure I just woke up someone. Go through the archive today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. And don't forget, get information about all Arcadian Vanguard shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard for news about all shows, including The Mothership. I can't do it. <laughs> The second time would have been too much. Yeah. First time was a little much anyway. All righty then. So we're down to SmackDown from Friday night, September 30th, the last day of the month. They were in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Do you know that's the first time that I ever went to Canada? I went to Winnipeg. The very first time you went to Canada? The very first time because I'm trying to think what year it was. There was. Crockett had done two shows in Canada around Ontario in 1987, and I was off for those shows because I had been suspended for burning Ronnie Garvin with the fireball, and I was in Hawaii. And that's where they took Crockett's plane, and it, the APU unit that controlled the heating and air burned out, and the cabin filled up with smoke, and everybody was panicking. And if I'd have been on that flight, I'd have never got on another airplane. But I wasn't there. So this was, I think it was like 1988-ish. It was, Crockett was running Winnipeg for some reason, and he was using Tony Candelo as the local promoter. And uh, Tony Candelo is famous in some circles for the, the death tours of the northern Canada provinces that where they go over the roads that are... <laughs> you know, like frozen lakes and they can only access this part of the world like three or four months out of the year or whatever. But he was based out of Winnipeg and he'd been around the wrestling business for a long time, had wrestled, had helped promote for Vern and the AWA. 
And they sent me up there by myself, the office, Crockett's office did, to do advanced publicity because it's the first time we'd been in the market. And remember, I guess Crockett had stopped running Toronto. He had the talent trade deal with uh, the Tunnies, but he had stopped that a couple of years before we went to work for him. And so anyway, point is, I'd never been to Canada. So they send me up there. I'm going to get there, whatever. The, if the show was on Saturday night, I got in on like Thursday night. And Tony Candela was going to take me all around Friday. We did radio. I think we did a newspaper interview. We might have stopped at a children's hospital. What a typical wrestling advanced publicity stuff, right? But I, I asked, well, what hotel should I stay at? And Candelo had said on the phone, I talked to him before I went up there, oh, there's such and such hotels where all the boys stay. So I fly up there, I get there, I get a car, I get to the fucking thing, I check in, and I see what I think is a, like a sports bar in the parking lot next door. I think, well, at least I'll have something to eat. I go over there. It's a fucking strip club. It was, it was a strip club. I'd never been to Canada, much less a Canadian strip club. But it looked like, from the outside, like a normal, like I said, sports bar or whatever. But I walk in the front of it, and there's, you know, naked women up on a stage. And I'm like, well, shit, now, does anybody know me in Winnipeg? Should I be here? Am I going to get beat up by some drunks? I said, fuck it, I just went back to the hotel and got a pizza. I wasn't opposed to the titties. I was opposed to who might know me and I might have heat with that was in the audience. But later on at the show, I found out that that shouldn't have been a concern because apparently nobody knew who the fuck we were up there at that point. Anyway, so finally we do all the publicity, you know, on the day before the show and everything. And then Candelo tells me, he said, well, there's a, there's a kid here in high school that wants to do an interview with you for his school paper. And I said, I, tell him to call me, give him the hotel number, tell him to call my room. Cause I'm not going to go honestly after this long day and this trip, meet with some high school kid and sit down and do a big interview for the school paper. Right. But I did it over the phone and he was a nice young man and I was nice to him and I didn't think anything more about it. And I found out, was it five or six years later when I ran into the kid again, guess who the kid was that interviewed me over the phone for his high school newspaper? Mauro Ranallo? No. A kid named Chris Irvine. Get out of here, really? I never Chris heard that. Eric, the, yes, he told me when I brought them down to Knoxville, him and Lance, to talk to him about coming into Smoky Mountain Wrestling. He said, you know, we've we've spoken before. When's that? I interviewed you for my high school newspaper when you were in a hotel in Winnipeg. And since that had only I've only been in a hotel in Winnipeg at that point in my life once. I knew it was him. Did he spend the whole interview telling you how smart he is? No, amazingly enough, it was actually an, a normal uh, interview with a normal high school student. Just whatever happened to him after that. But nevertheless, so we're in Winnipeg for SmackDown. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling conflicted, Brian, because old Madcap Moss, he's not with Corbin now. He's not wearing the goofy outfit. He looks like a great athlete. He's got a, an upside. He doesn't suck in the ring, but they're still calling him Madcap Moss, and I just refuse to fucking say Madcap again. That'll be the last time you hear it. So he's Moss from now on. But Zane and Solo started out with a tag match against Ricochet and Moss, and... Zane is playing up the asshole with the badass, you know, bodyguard perfectly. And the cocky, and I mean, everything he's doing lately has been gold. Solo, he's the Uso's younger brother, apparently legitimately. He's not that big. Of course, he's a Samoan. And he looks, he's serious. He's acting serious about this. He's got the facials. He looks great. I wanted to like him more in this match even than I did. Not to say there's anything wrong with him, but it was a lot of punch and kick. And I'm just thinking, Jacob Fatu in this spot would be a million-dollar player. 
that they could probably actually work for about a year, year and a half and end up splitting and having Roman Reigns against Jacob Fatu and gross millions of dollars on pay-per-view. Because Solo is serious and he's a good athlete and his work so far is okay. I'd like to see a little more variety. But he's got intensity, but he doesn't look like, I guess, like a like a lunatic. Like he looks like a junior Uso. He looks like a, he doesn't look like somebody that would lose control of himself and eat your face, even if he is a Samoan. <laughs> and he might very well do that, but he doesn't look like it, whereas Jacob Fatu does. I'm just thinking if uh, for an enforcer in the Samoan family there, they've just continued to overlook the obvious that's right in front of them. Anyway, they have this match. They do a big dive by, you know, Ricochet, and they go to the break in under four minutes. They come back. There's heat on Ricochet. Like I said, solo, okay, a lot of punch and kick. Then they just did simultaneous tags. No real hot tag. They just, oh, let's both just tag out and start over. And old Moss made his comeback, and they did a good finish. They had the people going. The crowd was behind Sammy, even though he's. Obviously, the heel is the most fun to watch, so they gravitate to him. And they did a couple of falses. Moss caught Sammy with a jackhammer, and Solo saved it. And then Ricochet was going to do a dive, but Sammy tripped him. And then Moss got on him, so the referee went with Sammy and Moss. Ricochet went for the dive anyway, and Solo <laughs> threw a chair and caught Ricochet in midair and threw him over the railing out to people. Or out in the the timekeeper's area that they, everybody gets thrown in, and then hit a spin kick and a rock bottom on Moss one two three. So I like Jesus Christ. Moss is a giant. He's jacked. He looks great. He's hopefully getting a fresh look and maybe a fresh name soon. And Mighty Mouse is his partner, and they beat Moss instead of Ricochet. So, and then Solo gets back on and gets extra heat on Moss after the fact. So they beat him up afterwards, too. Again, it who's picking the fucking talent that gets pushed and who's picking the talent that gets punked out? Because I'm thinking they need a trip to the ophthalmologist. Your thoughts? Well, again, Ricochet got signed because he had a lot of buzz off the indies and they pushed him from the moment he got there in NXT and then on the main roster, he's run into the problems that other people have. Mad Cop, Mad Cop, Mad Cat Moss was brought up with a comedy maybe, gimmick. Maybe that should be Mad Cop and he could dress up like a police officer. Well, maybe better than what he's done. Be the goofy sidekick to a goofy character. And now here he is again, same name, but he's now dressing like a wrestler. He's in great shape. We still don't know what else he could do, if he could do a good promo or anything else, really. But obviously, Ricochet's been a bigger priority for WWE. I mean, Ricochet's wonderful middle card baby face, good for the kids, does the flying stuff. Let's not seriously pretend like he needs to be a main event star. Does Madcap need to be a main event star? Do you think, just based on look and... A change of name he could be, or what do you, I mean, what do you based based on look and size and athletic ability, and with a name change, yes, he, based on those things, he could be a main event star. Now, is he is he coachable? Does he have a good attitude? Uh, is he going to continue to progress? That's a question. But you've got you've got the template to work with. You have material here, Ricochet wonderfully talented acrobat and we saw a couple weeks ago he can he can sell and have a wrestling match when somebody leads him to do one but is anybody gonna are you gonna ever buy ricochet versus roman reigns ricochet versus brock lesnar ricochet versus bobby lashley ricochet versus gunther let's just let's be honest and no, I, I, you know, and a lot of people will say, well, look at Rey Mysterio again. 
Rey Mysterio was revolutionary with what he did and grew up in a wrestling family and had the the psychology and the once in a generation or once in a lifetime combination of ability and charisma. Ricochet's a good acrobat. The the fact that he doesn't have a mask hurts him because there's that blank average face. And yes, you love the flips, but it's like the flying Greek Mike Pappas when he did the headstand on the top turnbuckle and then kicked off and landed in the middle of the ring and hit a guy with two or three quick drop kicks. That was great, but it was in the third match because if you put Mike Pappas against fucking the main event guy in any territory, it would have looked ridiculous because Pappas was 5'6 and only about 190 pounds, which meant he had about 30 on Ricochet. Anyway, good finish and all that stuff, uh, except they beat the wrong guy. But then in the back, they're wa- Solo and Sami Zayn are walking down the hall and they're going to the Bloodline locker room and they meet Jey Uso coming out. And then Jey calls Sammy off and says, hey, I see right through you. I know what you're all about. If you put my family in jeopardy, well, and I'm going to Sammy just say, hey, take it up with Roman. So I love the conflict that they've got. Except I wish they would come up with more creative ways to impart this information to the viewer than to just have the guy saying it right in front of a television camera. And that means that Roman Reigns can see this anytime he wants to. So we're almost expected to believe that Roman Reigns is stupid or ignorant or not paying attention to what's going on. You know, they they don't have to all just come out and speak right in front of a camera. Can't you eavesdrop on a guy in a corner on a cell phone or whatever? Nevertheless, what do you think about Karrion Cross, Brian? Is he going to be a main event guy? How's his promos? How's his work? How's his package, which includes Scarlet? Tell me your thoughts. Oh, well, there's a lot there. I've definitely thought different things about him at different times. I think he has a good look. I'm not ready to say he'll be a main eventer. I think the fire angle last week was botched, although in general, him and Scarlett have been pretty good as a package together. I think yeah. he loses a lot without her, and we've seen that in real time. Yeah. What were your other questions? Well, just basically the presentation. Do you think, because a lot of people are saying, oh, he's going to be a top guy, and we know Triple H, obviously brought him back with that intention and they're pushing him. I think the hair is not doing him any favors. I think he looked more extreme bald, more harsh bald. We haven't seen that much of his work. I know somebody's going, oh, I've seen him wrestle a million times. I'm talking about me. I haven't seen him that many times, but I don't have anything against it. I think whether he becomes a superstar or not, they're going to put him in the main event, so he's going to be a main event guy. But w- whether he becomes a real main event player and a superstar depends or not on whether he develops the ability to do these promos like the spooky video that they did. Whether he can do these promos in this style with no script, sounding like he really means it, it's him, it's coming off the top of his head. That's going to be the difference because the spooky video and the atmospheric entrances and all the the different ways they're presenting him, that's great. That's fine. But when he verbally delivers this like he did in this video interview package, verbally his delivery sounds like that he prepared these remarks and he's reciting them. He's better at it than a lot of the guys. But he's still not there where, when Scott Hall was Razor Ramon, and they gave him an interview they wanted him to say, obviously, back in those days, you'd still change a lot, but Scott Hall sounded like Razor Ramon, and the shit was coming off the top of his head, right? It was not prepared, it didn't sound rehearsed. Same thing with Nash, same thing with 
any Attitude Era star, any major territory star, the spooky stuff they're doing with Cross will work, but only if it if it feels to the people like it's him rather than he's a guy playing this part. And I don't I don't hear the inflections, I don't hear the the emphasis, the meaning in the right place to where it sounds like this is him. And I guarantee you, he couldn't do this promo unless he or someone else had written it down and then he is memorized it and is reciting it. In other words, unless you can do this from scratch, when somebody walks up to you with a camera and a microphone and it would sound the same way, as if it was written and prepared, blah, 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 then, then you're, you're not, it's not going to get over for you. You have to be that person, and I don't believe the things he's saying to me. Now that I've said those things, do you see what I'm talking about, or did I do a crummy job of explaining no, it? No, you do. I do see what you're saying, and I agree with you for the most part. And, you know, when he first returned, I remember I didn't watch SmackDown that week, but I saw a photo going around of him, I guess he came out of the crowd and he attacked Drew McIntyre or something, but he was in his street clothes. And he looked like a crazy badass who jumped the rail and got involved with a wrestler. And I think that's one of the frustrating things with him and Scarlett. They don't need the spooky shit. And we've seen way too much spooky stuff. We don't need to see any more wrestlers with smoke machines. Like, that can go <laughs> away. We've seen a lot of it. We've seen too much lately. You know, back in the old days, the wrestlers didn't need smoke machines. They just opened the door of their car. Well, I think part of the problem is Scarlett and Karrion Cross don't need all that, but because they have all that, it doesn't make them stand out like it would if they didn't have it. That was very deep. Thank you. As Mama Cornette used to say, well, that's a deep subject. Well, the rest of it will be surface level. I promise you that. All righty. Well, we'll do the best we can to be completely uh, surfacey. Anyway, Austin Theory, what have they done to my boy? He did a backstage interview, and it was more noticeable here because he's a guy that wants to look at people he's talking to and wants to, as a cocky heel, you know, it, it, you could tell he was trying not to look at the camera because they're still telling, for whatever reason that Vince had in his demented mind, the talent still in a pre-tape backstage with an interviewer, will not look at the camera because Vince didn't like that. So he's trying to look everywhere around this giant camera on the shoulder of a six-foot fucking grown adult man that's three feet in front of him. But he knocked Drew McIntyre and said, Wales is Europe's Winnipeg. Talking about his match in Cardiff, and that was pretty good. Winnipeg is Canada's Kansas City, by the way. And so he knocks Drew McIntyre, and then Drew comes up behind him and puts his hand on his shoulder. And when Theory huh, and looks around, oh, Drew McIntyre just says, you and me in the ring now. And they go to the break. So now Drew McIntyre can just walk up and make a match with somebody on a network TV program with three minutes notice. So it's good to know he's got that power. Because when we come back, there it is. There's the match. Theory versus Drew McIntyre. And I'm, this is ridiculous. This guy was going to be the chosen one. He got the money in the bank briefcase. He was Vince's protege. He's a tremendous worker. Which one are you he's talking about? Theory. Oh. He's got the physical tools. He it, Everything. And now just whatever... He did to piss whoever off since Vince has been gone. He's a flunky. And the only reason he's clinging to that money in the bank briefcase by a thread. And that's the only thing he's got in his back pocket. And that the, he had that before they started this teardown project. So now it's theory versus drew and theory for backup brings out Otis and Gable. So they start the match, and again, he's great at it, but Theory is presented like an ineffectual flunky. Chop Drew McIntyre, McIntyre doesn't sell it and looks at him. Bumps Theory around effortlessly at will. 
Theory gets on him for a good 30 seconds, and then McIntyre comes back, and then Beals Gable into the ring, and then Otis drags the fucking guy out, and they just call for the bell disqualification. Just at, So a nothing match, short, Theory gets little, he's accompanied by mid-card comedy figures, and then it's a cheap DQ, and they start getting on Drew three-on-one when this whole thing has been lame. And then music plays, and here comes Johnny Same Face. And I'm like, my God, now Johnny Same Face is making a save for Drew McIntyre? But fortunately, no, he didn't. He got in with a flurry. But then the heels took him down and got on that fucking minuscule dwarf for a, a second and then more music plays and here comes kevin owens and now there's the big save and all three baby faces are back up on their feet and all three heels leave with their tail stuck between their legs by the end of this thing so there they kept trying to do something in this segment but it didn't do anything for anybody it certainly didn't do anything for austin theory it didn't really do anything for Drew McIntyre. Gable and Otis are past their expiration date at this point to begin with. It lasted barely a few minutes, and all they did was set up a six-man tag for the main event of this same program with these people that we've already been looking at for fucking 20 fucking minutes. Between the promo and the match and the angle and the blast saves and the... It's like they've only got six people on their roster, Brian. Same ones every week in multiple segments for multiple periods of time. And now it's multiple shows. Because these guys yes. are on Raw. Yeah, because now the, the which the brand splits ignorant to begin with. And we've talked about that, but they just they only observe it whenever they want to, and otherwise people just show up on whatever program. Besides what you think about Gargano, and I'm not a big fan of his either. But if you look at this objectively, maybe I'm wrong, but are the fans even reacting to him? They play his music, he ran out there, but did they pop for Johnny Gargano coming out there? Or did they just sit there and watch? Well, it depends. Because they the pipe that, in noise, obviously, but you can kind of tell yes. what's real and what isn't. The ones that liked him before like him again, and the people that didn't like him before don't give a shit about him now. And it depends on, you know, they brought him back in, where was it, Toronto with the biggest per capita audience of really smart fans. Toronto's a place that would like Gargano. And if they went to fucking St. Petersburg, well, no, Florida, he's probably all his family down there. If they went to fucking Burleson, Texas, they might not be as fond of him. It just, but I, again, if anybody is deluding themselves into thinking that Johnny same face is going to be any kind of difference maker in ratings or, tickets or pay-per-view or fucking merchandise or whatever the fuck come on um they did a show long bit in the back that may lead to something we want to see with the maximum male models max dupree and lady dupree and whatever the maxine fuck. maxine dupree there you go yeah and and mansoir and mansoor and they were going for the longest world's record for the longest pose. And they kept going back to this. And, but each time Max Drake, LA or Max, no wait, Max Dupree, LA Knight, Eli Drake, he'd come in and, and show disgust with them. And obviously they're, they're just trying to get out of this as quickly as possible because they're not even going to, I guess do this live in front of the people. Just backstage. Get it over with and get him away from this shit. But they will by the by the end of the night, hopefully so we're gonna see LA night again. Los Lotharios had a three minute match against Skid Row, and they're not letting them rap on the way to the ring anymore. Did you notice that? Oh, you mean hit row. What did I say? You said Skid Row. I started thinking, is there a tag team of Skid Row? I didn't okay, even remember well, that you were talking about hit row. Whatever row they're in, uh, they're in the general admission seats. They didn't let them rap anymore on the way to the ring. Thank fuck. Thank God. Uh, but three minutes, Skid Row, our Skid Row. 
Death Row, Hit Row, The Row House, they all won. <laughs> um, God, the the fat guy, old AJ. Top dollar. Top dollar. Brother, boy, howdy. He's convinced he knows what the fuck he's doing, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, look, <sighs> should have spent more time in wrestling school, less time shaking down John Pantosi. There you go. To come back to haunt him. Uh, yeah, they suck. They're they're really bad. Uh, Ronda Rousey was in the back and slept, walked through a promo for about 20 seconds and then came out and had a match with Natalia. And did you notice the most notable thing about the Ronda Rousey versus Natalia match? Was it Ronda wearing the red shirt? No, it was Ronda Rousey's entrance to the ring with music came at the top of the 9 p.m. hour. So they may not have any fucking very many stars on this program, but they know where to put them. Again, a simple Vinceism. Top of the hour and to a lesser extent, the bottom of the hour, you need a star headed to the ring or in the ring. So again, you know, Natalia tried here. Rhonda took over almost immediately. Her judo is great. Her work is herky-jerky and awkward. It's not smooth at all. She's not getting better. I don't know that she's trying. I, I think, by everything you can see from Rhonda Rousey, that the bloom is off the rose for her on this wrestling thing. And she's doing it now because she signed a contract. I don't see her having a ton of fun. I don't see her trying to improve. I don't see her going out there and just goddamn shucking the corn all the way down to the cob on the promos and just really being into this. It's like, get it over with. And that's the way we feel watching her at this point. Natalia did a good job getting her through this, but finally Rhonda slipped out of a slam, got the ankle lock, and got a tap out in, what, four minutes or was it four minutes? And then music plays and here comes Liv Morgan out with a baseball bat. So now you have this preposterously plastic, painted up Barbie, all five foot two and 92 pounds of her, that brought out at dragging a baseball bat. I thought it might because it was too heavy for her to lift. And then they stand there and face each other, her and Rhonda. And then she goes to swing the bat at Rhonda, and Rhonda just boots her in the stomach and stops her. <laughs> and then. She goes to swing again, and Rhonda ducks out of the way, and Liv Morgan hits the ring post three feet above where Rhonda Rousey's head was. I mean, th there was no chance of an accident here. There was. Why would you even do something like that? You can see where the human being in front of you is, right? So swing, and if they don't move, apologize right? But if you know they're going to move and you're making any attempt to try to make it look good, you're going to swing somewhere in the vicinity of where their head was, right? Try to go maybe right over the top or to the side or just hope they duck or whatever. No, let's three feet just to make sure. And then Ronda Rousey gave Liv Morgan, all 92 pounds of her, her Piper's Pit finish on the floor. And 10 seconds later, by an actual count, Liv Morgan is up fighting with Ronda with a tug of war over the bat. And then Ronda flipped her over the rail and walked off, picking her shorts out of her crotch. But Liv comes from behind and they have a big pull apart. This would have been good with anybody but Liv Morgan. But on the bright side, she's pretty good with the bat. Maybe the Phillies can sign her. Oh, good Lord. Um... They have women. They Lacey Evans, Charlotte, Rhea Ripley. You could Bianca Belair. You could buy any of these people against Ronda Rousey. But it's Liv Morgan. What, does, does Liv Morgan have pictures of somebody with a with a sheep? Or I, I, maybe in Japan, maybe here. I'm not quite sure, but. You know, I think part of the problem, and maybe I'm wrong because I'm not a big WWE modern fan, but I feel like Liv Morgan's less over this week than she was a month ago than she was two months ago as they were trying to build her into something here. 
I feel like the more we've seen of her, the less over she is with their audience. Unless I'm wrong, but based on the reaction, based on watching this stuff, I'm not sure what they're doing. But look, the women's divisions everywhere are a mess. You brought up Charlotte. We haven't seen Charlotte in forever. Who's the other name? Lacey Evans. Lacey Evans got put through a table last week. The first time I've ever seen a woman destroyed like that on TV. It was on this show last week by Liv Morgan. By Liv Morgan. Yeah, so we don't even know if we'll see her again. Because what a way to write someone off TV than that. Well, so thankfully, here came Imperium. And they started doing an in-ring promo about the brawling brutes. And next week, the rematch is going to be between Gunther and, and Sheamus. And as I was watching these guys stand in the ring and the way they talk and the expressions and Gunther is just amazing. I'm thinking if Bill Watts had had these guys or Eddie Graham had had these guys, they would be communist officers or Nazi soldiers. They would need police protection in and out of the arenas everywhere they went. They would have snipers <laughs> staking out the interstate, waiting for them to drive out of town. These guys could have been the hottest fucking heels that anybody's ever seen. But they're wasted in sports entertainment in the modern day environment. They're too good for this. And it, it just, you know, I can see goddamn Gunther getting death threats, just coming to the ring and brutalizing the local territory babyface and swearing allegiance to whoever the fucking commandant is of the goddamn, you know, his, his fucking, his force or whatever. Horst Hoffman. But, Horst Hoffman. There you go. But anyway, but they barely do a minute. And then here comes the brawling brutes music, but Seamus comes out alone because Ridge and Butch are in Florida. And Seamus does a brief and fairly uninspired promo. And then they get in the, the obligatory fight because, again, the thing that WWE television, Raw or SmackDown needs more than anything else is a complete revamp of the way they format everything and the way that everything happens the same way every week. Yes. Interview, interruption, match, either then or later on in the show. <laughs> match finish is... <laughs> Guy's making a comeback, somebody distracts him, turns into a finish, whatever. It's but in this case, they had a fight where Seamus took a shillelagh and knocked out Kaiser and Vinci. And I don't know why this guy's name is Italian and he's in the but nevertheless, he knocks them out with a blow each and then gets in the ring with Gunter and has a fight with Gunther, and then the Stooges come back just at the right time after they'd been down forever and disappeared, and they get heat on Seamus and trash-talking and a powerbomb Seamus. But this was by the numbers. Nobody tried to help. They sweetened the booze. The heels walk off, and Seamus gets on the microphone and says, Is that all you got? And the heels come back and beat the fuck out of him again and hit him with his own shillelagh and walk out again. So that worked. But between the sweetened booze and the sports entertainment presentation, on the same program, you have security, and this is not just WWE, it's AEW, you have security breaking up shit between women and children that doesn't go on for 10 seconds, and then you have five-minute attempted murders that nobody says a peep about, and there's no consistency. And... Uh, I, I love Gunther, but there's almost nobody for him to work with. That you where you get to see the real Gunther. And then they have to do this shit in the middle. What do you think? Well, you know, Jim, they had that one match in Cardiff, Wales, and I wasn't as crazy about it as you were. And now we'll get to see them on TV domestically. I'm actually looking forward to that. I would like to see them one more time and give it another chance with multiple commercial breaks. I liked I liked Gunther in that match. Sheamus held up his part, but uh, people were saying it was the greatest WWE match of modern times or whatever. No, I'll tell you what. I still pick Gunther and Ilya Dragunov in that match they had on whatever that NXT big show was about a year, year and a half ago as one of the goddamnedest matches I've seen from anybody anywhere in years. But go ahead. 
What do you do when you have guys that are on your roster that have been there for a while that fans recognize that some fans really like, but they've been there for such a long time, but you don't have new bodies to fill those roles? Like someone like Sheamus, and I hate to bring it up, but someone like Natalia earlier. Natalia's great in the ring. We've been watching her for what, 15 years? Yeah. She's been there a long time, and it's not like they have other people to put out there, but when they come out, sometimes you're like, okay, I know what this is because I've been watching this for a very long time. Sheamus. It's had different gimmicks, different songs, different entrances. But it's Seamus. I've been watching this guy forever. I'm sick of it. But again, to my earlier point, you said, who's Imperium going to work with? They don't have that many people they could put in there. So well, what see, that, that's their fault. That, it, the talent situation today is the fault of the WWE. Their talent situation, because they've had access going back 20 years. How many times did we say, well, this guy at OVW, that guy at OVW would have been fantastic if they'd had a chance, if they'd have not hamstrung him with a ridiculous gimmick or stupid presentation or brought him in, treated him like job guys. You know, whether it be Matt Morgan or the Bashams or Dinsmore or Jeter, all these guys would still be youthful and would be on the tail end of their careers that they never really ended up having because they were all wasted. And they've been doing the same thing since then. And so it's their fault that they don't have more talent. But it's also their fault that, that, that the fans, as you said, get too familiar and too used to and too bored with the talent. Familiarity breeds contempt is the opposite of how can I miss you if you won't go away. And there's no reason why, especially over the last 10 or 15 years, as big as that company has become, and with all the guaranteed revenue streams they have, and the fact that they don't give the talent any benefits or retirement or health or whatever the case, why couldn't they just say, look, so-and-so, Brian Last on my roster is a talent that I believe in and want to use more in the future but he's been here we've done just about everything with him right now he needs a break we are going to in a in a in an organized fashion figure out a way to tie up the loose ends of whatever he's doing on the on the show and send him home or away for three to six months and generally home Instead of away, because where you're going to send a guy to Japan, well, I wouldn't, you know, that some guys might like that if they got sent to a foreign country. I'd say, fuck you. <laughs> I didn't sign with an American company to be sent to Japan for six months or whatever. Uh, but just get them off your television. But don't beat them into powder before they go. And, and just some way or another, whether it's an injury or whether it's a losing a match or whatever, give them a reason to be gone and then bring them back with a surprise when the people might be more agreeable to seeing them again. That's the, you know, that's the, the it seems like what they haven't been doing when they've had the money to pay these guys is protect their investment everybody stays on the roster until they're moved down the card and beaten into powder and used in every possible way and then they're released well then they're they're not any good to the to anybody else but they're not any good to the wwe unless you bring them back after five years when everybody's forgotten about that if you give a guy a graceful exit to the of the program for just a few months when they're still reasonably in a good position, then they will come back in as good or better position because people didn't see them be torn down first. You should only beat a guy into powder when you have no more further use for him and you don't want to re-sign him and you know he's going to go somewhere else. And so that's where you beat the shit out of him first because you don't want to give the competitor a, you know, a viable drawing card. But uh, so when you just see these people on and on and you can't feature them constantly and, and it gets tiresome, 
they're not protecting their investments. And because they make so few new stars, the investments of, of people they do have with some recognition are, are more important than ever. And then there's the fact that look at the talent. Where, where, where's the next Brock Lesnar? Maybe there might not be another human being look like Brock Lesnar, but we're down to, we don't have fighters anymore. We don't have ex football players. We don't have fucking tough guys that don't fit into society and want to get in wrestling because it's the wild west. Those were the stars. We have small, timid, fucking performance artists that want to get into the business to be on TV and possibly pursue a career in reality television or major motion pictures. So what's going into the talent development programs is not as good as what was going into them 20 and 30 and 40 years ago either. And for all those Wild West personalities who would want to get into wrestling because they don't fit anywhere else, <laughs> they'd get fired or sued if they were in wrestling now because wrestling's like everything else now. A bunch of fucking pussies with easily hurt feelings and you can't say boo to a goose without somebody doing an investigation. And Lord forbid that two guys have a problem and decide to fucking see who's right one way or the other. Because goddamn then they'll all be suspended. Uh, what was the question? About guys who have been there a long time and the idea there aren't people to replace them, but they're still on TV. Yeah, well, I suggest that Kevin Dunn and the rest of the goddamn bullshit bogus executives that have never taken a bump in their life take uh, at least not one in a ring, maybe off a mirror, take uh, three or $4,000 off your 15 million bucks that you fucking con the company out of every year to do your job and put it in a fund to pay the wrestlers to go away for three to six months at a time, heal up their bodies and get new again and come back as a bigger attraction instead of a fucking stale, moldy old piece of bread. But the next match... Speaking of moldy old piece of bread, more SmackDown. Yes, well, Bailey and Shotzi. Shotzi's got her tank back, but I'll watch this for Bailey. I like Bailey's shit. I'm not really sure what Shotzi was doing. I can't tell if she could work or not. They did three minutes of back and forth and went to the break. They come back from the break. And Shotzi started her comeback with the world's first ever one-footed drop kick to the pussy. Did you see that? I actually did not watch this match. Okay, well... Now I, now I wish I had. The one time you watch a women's match and I don't, I miss this. Shotzi rolled out of the corner to avoid Bailey. When Bailey turns around, Shotzi gets a run and goes to drop kick her. And went up as far as her right foot kicking Bailey in the pussy, and that's as high as she got off the ground. And Bailey kind of fell back in a heap, and then she suplexed Bailey into the turnbuckles with a snap vertical suplex, so kind of on top of her head. And then Bailey jerked Shotzi off the ropes and hit her finish one, two, three. And then Bailey got more heat on shot. Now the WWE is emulating AEW. The match can never end when the heel wins because then the heel has to get more heat. Remember, it used to be the heel will either fuck the babyface and win and leave with the heat, or the babyface would win legally and then the heel would jump on him and kick the shit out of him. Now the heel wins legally <laughs> and then beats the babyface up even further. So, uh, Bailey pulled out a ladder because, of course, it's Bianca versus Bailey in a ladder match on the Extreme Rules pay per view next weekend. And she put Shotzi in the middle of the ladder, and Shotzi was kind enough to help put herself in it and then hold it in place. <laughs> and then Bianca's music plays before Bailey can jump off the top rope onto the ladder with. Shotzi in the middle of it and Bianca ran to the ring this time instead of skipping and unfolded the ladder so that Shotzi could suddenly come back to life and roll out <laughs> you know the ladder when the ladder's laying on the ground right the ladder folds folds out right you know how ladder works you've seen him before in the in the newspapers I have yes 
So imagine if you're laying on one section of the ladder and the other section is on top of you. All you have to do is kind of just go push up and the ladder opens. It's not locked, right? Well, Shotzi was trapped in this thing until Bianca picked it up. And then suddenly Shotzi came back to life and rolled out. And then Bailey got on Bianca. And then Bianca came out of that and got on Bailey and Bailey ran off. And that was that, and you didn't watch it, so I won't ask you what you thought about it. But then, finally, the best thing I saw all night, we go to the back, the models are still posing, and Max Dupree comes in and says, you know what, fuck this, and beat up the models. Punched them both and quit. So I'm done with all of y'all. So apparently, Eli Drake L.A. Knight is coming back, because... Even it, it, a Triple H, nobody there could possibly have seen what Vince did to this guy and thought that's the best use of this guy, best use of this guy on our roster, and we're paying him. So that was that. And then they start the six man fucking tag with um, the goddamn group from before Otis and Gable and Theory against Drew and Owens and. Corning Fiberglass. What, what's the other guy's name? Ricochet. And I can't watch that six-man tag. I've just seen their shit earlier. And that's not a main event for a network television program. So I skipped that, and that was SmackDown. What do you think, Brian? I skipped that, too, and that was SmackDown. <laughs> I'm not a Gargano fan. I'm not really into Owens. And then, you know, I know they do this a lot, the idea of something happens early in the show, and they build up a match later in the show. But I was already sick of seeing all these people. I want to see something else. Well, and I, and I get there's a hurricane, so maybe that was one of the reasons why. Maybe that was one of the reasons why it was they were in Winnipeg. The hurricane was a thousand miles away from where they were. Well, maybe not everyone could get there. Is what I was going to say. A lot well, of wrestlers. Who else w could have been on this show that could have helped it out? Well, I think if Butch and Ridge were there, it would have changed the entire makeup of the show. But of course, uh. like everyone else, they've learned that Florida has no state income tax. Nor standards, apparently. Nor standards. Or an, and also an insane governor, but we won't go into that. Um, yeah, the shows, it's the talent at this point is being poorly served by the, the television program rather than the other way around. The way these shows are formatted and that they happen, they unfold at the same pace in the same way with the same things happening with the same people every fucking week unless you just really like any of these individuals and just want to see them do the same thing all the time that's what you're watching with the wwe and i'm not shitting on triple h he's got plenty of work to do and i think he realizes that but i don't know if they obviously and even when i was there 20 25 years ago the creative team formats the actual show, determines what talent is on it and what they do on it. But the actual formatting of the show, the way that it's shot, the way that VTRs are interspersed, the way that the whole thing transpires, no matter who's on it, the way it's produced and the, the, the pace of it. Kevin Dunn's had a lot to do with that and did 25 years ago and probably has much more to do with it now. And that's why he needs to be old Yellard out by the barn because it, this program on will film. never get on film. That would get ratings, especially from the boys. But uh, until there is a a concerted effort to revamp the, the formatting and the flow and the way that Raw and SmackDown happen and transpire in front of you, regardless of who's on it or what match has taken place or whatever, they're not going to get anywhere because it's boring, it's dull, and it takes forever for shit to happen. And you see the same people all the time. And none of this was a hallmark of Vince McMahon's television when business was the biggest. So they've forgotten a lot of things they learned, and so did Vince. Apparently, Alzheimer's will do that to you. 
But now they, they've got to reformat it bad. They need a new producer. They need new creative talent in the studio and in the production end that can hopefully make this thing look a little better. And I don't mean quality why they spend a ton of money on it, but it's it's the most pristine, clean, homogenized, pasteurized, boring, big budget production ever. I think they ought to concentrate on spending a little less money and get a little more grit and grime on this thing and hook people with something that they may be able to believe with some talent that they can get into. And having said that, we go back to, unfortunately, the only people wanting to get into wrestling schools these days are fucking performance artists that are 180 pounds and like to do male cheerleading routines. So, what's a boy to do, Brian? The boy will talk about more wrestling on the drive through this week. Well, boy, in that case, that's exactly where I am going to be. I'm going to be on your drive through and you're going to be asking me, and I'm going to be answering. And until then, for the experience, for Jason and Evan and the late Kanji Anoki and Brian and all the rest of the people at Arcadian Vanguard and or the Wrestling News and Stacy and Harley Quinn and the Monroes and so many more, thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>